Yeah, Chair Mo, everybody, can you let me know if you can hear clearly and if, if the images are clear, let me know in the chat room. And we're gonna give people a, a few minutes to log in. But anybody in the chat room, just let me know if you can hear clearly and if you can see. Okay, get us. It's 8.01, so we're going to get started at about 8.05, just give enough people time, people enough time to, to log in. So for people who are aware, we're in the French Quarter right now. So if you hear some music in the background, that is Kalinda's music. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's coming from downstairs. So Okay, so your chairmo greetings did I say everyone for joining in with us. So some of you are aware, some of you may be new to, to the information, but this is our Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference. This is our eighth annual conference. So typically what we have is we have an event, an all-day event in DC. Um, I'm, I'm based in DC, I'm from Chicago, but I'm based in DC now over the past few years. So we would have an event 
all day we would have presenters and so forth, um, vendors on you know different aspects of the tradition. This year we wanted to do something a little bit different. We are live streaming from New Orleans. We are in the French Quarter. We mentioned earlier for people who didn't weren't on at the time that you may hear some music in the background, but we are in the French Quarter, so you will hear some you know some different kinds of kinds of music <laughs> coming up. So, but um, we're doing it in the context of a podcast. This is the first, um, in a sense, our first podcast, and I just want to show you on the screen quickly. So what we're going to start doing is we're going to have a Hoodoo cast. This is our hoodoocast.com page. That's the introduction page. And we'll be doing, you know, um, this, this kind of content, you know, going forward. This is the first podcast, Hoodoo cast, but it's also in, in the context of the Etchy Sign Conference. So let me flip back real quick so you can see the information in the background. So we started Etchy Sign back in 13,016, so-called 2016. There's always around the autumn, or I'm sorry, the spring equinox. So the spring equinox this year was on Benada, Tuesday, Abenada. So we always have this conference Etchi in the Akan language means back and sign means to return. So it means to return back to our primordial pristine state our essential nature returning to our ancestral religious practices. But it's not just an icon term. The term chi in ancient Kemet means back and sign also means to return. So we preserve this culture and context in our ancestral religious practices. Thousands of years from ancient Kanita Kemet, we migrated west, continued the culture after the invasions of ancient Kemet a couple of thousand years ago, some of our people migrated west. We established the Western empires such as Ghana, Mali, Songhai, various empires and so forth. And then because of Muslim invasion, some of our people migrated from those regions further south towards the forest belt in the regions of today's Ghana, Ivory Coast, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, Gabon and so forth. And we continue to practice our ancestral religious culture. And then some of us, a few hundred years later, were taken from those regions and forced into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during what we call the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. But those of us who maintained our ancestral religious practices, those are the individuals who waged war against the white enslavers, forced the end of enslavement, attacked, killed them, and so forth, established independent sovereign nations in various parts of the South, East and Western United States, some of those cities and towns and, and settlements and independent, you know, black settlements still exist today, 100 plus years later. So Etchi Sign is talking about going back to our ancestral religious practices, those that we preserve in our blood circles over the past 300 plus years in North America that which we brought with us. So those of us who are forced from the Akan tradition and Yoruba tradition and Bodu tradition and Fang tradition and Wanga tradition and so forth, when we were forced into North America, we maintained our ancestral religious practices. We didn't forget anything. We didn't lose our culture. We didn't lose our um, ritual practices and so forth. We continued to communicate with the Nananom and Samampo, the Kubito, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles. They continue to possess us. We continue to communicate with the Vodou with the Abosom, with the Orisha, the Arusi, the deities, they continue to communicate with us through spirit possession and spirit communication. And when you have spirit possession and spirit communication, then you have ancestral religion. You have access to the fullness of one million generations of earthly experience because you have direct communication and connection with your spirit genetic ancestors and ancestors. So Echi Sign is about dealing with and exploring and examining and reinstituting in an authentic fashion those ancestral religious practices we preserved in our blood circles in North America since we were forced into the Western Hemisphere. So we often have traditions, the voodoo tradition, the hoodoo tradition, 
the Wanga tradition, the Ngangan tradition, the Gullah Geechee tradition, and so forth, whatever religious practice that we maintained in our blood circles here, that's what we showcase, and that's what we examine and highlight in the Etchi Sign Conference. So, okay. So again, this is a little bit different. We want to do it in the format of a podcast. So it's a discussion. You'll, you can post questions um, in the chat room as we go along and we'll answer questions and so forth. It'll be a two-part piece. So for those who are unaware, I'm Ojirafo Kwesi Ranehmata Khan, Ojirafo of Apongman and Marukati, Moody Apongu Nation in North America, also the co-founder of Udu Jasetai, which is the hearth shrine of Akan and such religion in North America. Hudu is the tradition, the Akan tradition as we're gonna get into tonight. Jasedan is the term for our hearth shrine or temple. So it's a Hudu temple, but we call it Hudu Jasedan. So I'm also a traditional Odumafo or a diviner in the Hudu tradition. And of course we have Hudu Queen Kalinda Laveau, who was based in Louisiana, based in New Orleans, um, dealing with the Voodoo tradition from an authentic perspective. And so the first half, we're gonna talk about the voodoo tradition. And then the second, we'll, have, we'll take a little break. And then the second half, we'll talk about the voodoo tradition. Of course, we'll answer questions and so forth. And we'll move in that fashion. So let me make sure we don't have them. Just want to check to make sure people are not trying to get in right now. Are you <laughs> All right, so I just want to start off. Um, we're talking about voodoo and people hear about voodoo, they hear about very often when you hear voodoo, at first it was always talking about Haitian voodoo. Everything was about Haiti. If you're in North America, you hear about voodoo, you hear about Haiti. And of course, black people were forced, if you have people who were in that region, in the region of now Togo and Benin and parts of Ghana and so forth, and even parts of Nigeria, if some of them were taken from those regions, and split up, some were sent to Haiti, some were sent to North America, some were sent to Brazil, some were sent to Cuba, some were sent to Guyana and so forth. So as we went to these different places, and it's true with the various traditions, we maintained our tradition, but it was based on our blood circle and the environment within which we found ourselves. So very often, because people were writing about Haiti and they kind of sensationalized that everything was about Haiti, then about 20 years ago, when people started especially people from here started traveling to West Africa, Africa, West Africa. More people started talking about specifically Benin, sometimes Togo to a certain extent, but this notion of voodoo in the United States, they always attribute it to, oh, it must've come from Haiti or you just didn't have anything. Or some people would say that, some of these crackers would say that there was no voodoo tradition in New Orleans. It all came from Haiti and everything that they deal with in New Orleans is just something made up, which is nonsense. So we just want to start off with some true story. So there's a true historical piece, and you talked about this before. So what is the significance? I know they had a they had a acknowledgement, basically a ceremony, a series of ceremonies, an acknowledgement of the 300 year anniversary of the first people who were enslaved from that region over here in uh, a few years ago. So what was the significance of that with regard to how voodoo is practiced? Yeah. So I wanna start by saying the concept of what we have here in Louisiana uh, and in New Orleans, the idea of that coming from Haiti was something that has been popularized um, in a large way, I would say in the late 80s, early 90s. Before that time, nobody really talked about that. Um, and of course, you always had people who may have traveled. You know, you had the um, you know information coming from Zora Neale Hurston and her travels, and Catherine Dunham and, and her travels and studies with um, Afro Caribbean based dances and things like that. But for the most part, nobody was really saying that here. It was just kind of always understood that we had voodoo here, nobody talked about Haiti at all. And so then what happened was you had these stores because there's always been um, stores, especially in New Orleans, 
uh, tourist based shops, uh, tours that are, you know, speaking about voodoo, um, you know, and, and for a long time, whatever they made up, you know, whatever type of Hollywood explanation they gave of voodoo was sufficient for most people. Um, and, you know, there's always been a divide between what was told, you know, by tour guides and what was presented in these very commercial, usually white owned shops. There's a big difference between that and the tradition that people in Louisiana knew that we had, right. you know, you wouldn't recognize if we looked in those shops, we don't, wouldn't recognize that to be voodoo and then vice versa. They wouldn't know what they were looking at either. So the thing was, when we say we went underground, we went secret with our practice because there were specific times in our history where it was illegal to practice voodoo. It was illegal to play drums. You know, sometimes that was punishable by death to be caught practicing voodoo. And then even still today, we still deal with the social stigma of practicing voodoo. So even aside from, you know, worrying about uh, legal repercussions of practicing voodoo, now there's a social stigma. So you may just be a person that, you know, you want to get along good with your neighbors. You want to be able to go to the post office. You want to be able to go to the market in peace. You don't want everybody crossing the street because they're scared of you. And I, I say that literally because that has and still does happen to me. People don't understand what it is that I do. I've had grown men twice my height. <laughs> Not really twice my height, but you know. Yeah, you know. Uh, grown men cross the street because they don't understand what I mean by I practice voodoo, you know. So most people don't want to deal with that type of uh, isolation and, and nobody really wants to be an outcast in that way. You just want to have a peaceful life. You just want your family, your children to be able to have a normal life. So we took the practice and it went in secret. And so in secret, <clears throat> you would have different, you know, this, we wouldn't come out in, in like a public way. So families had their traditions, you know, it, it went inside, it went, you know, in isolated regions, if it was going to be held outside and then it would be in households. So now we begin to have it preserved in, you know, families. So when we say secret, like I said, we really mean secret. So now these shops, these tours, they needed an authentic tradition to actually inform their tours, to inform these trinkets that they were selling in stores. There needs to be something to validate that because otherwise, you know, how far can you really go with that? So we, the, the stores didn't have any connection to the underground, well, not underground, but secret, you know, no, inaccessible no. tradition. So they had to go somewhere. Yeah, because even if we had some type of a, a, a store or, you know, uh, market set up, this was going to be in secret. Mm -hmm. It's going to be inside of a washeteria. It's going to be inside of a barbershop, maybe upstairs mm -hmm. or maybe in another room. It's not going to be, you can't go in, in public and look from the outside and it says, you know, such and such voodoo shop. Right. You know, um, that's that's not how it works. So most of the time the practice was inside of a person's home or they may have a separate building, a separate shed, a separate location or a, a separate um, room or floor inside of an existing business that was secret. Most of the black community would know about it, but not everyone would know about it. Not everybody just had access to it. So these shops that were commercially, voodoo this, voodoo that, this museum, that shop, this center, they didn't have access to the real thing because we would not inform them. You know, this is how we survive. Not only did our, our tradition survive, but this is how we survive. So they begin to travel back and forth to Haiti and usually the, the connection was with Haitian artists. So this would be with your sequence flag makers, your painters, your musicians, 
your dancers, and especially your drummers. Those are the main connection and they remain the, the connection even today. You don't have a lot of uh, situations where just, you know, uh, priest and priestesses, you know, uh, would become the informants. Now, later that, that has happened, but for the most part, you've got artists. And so with the, um, with the Haitian art, if you're talking about the art that comes from, you know, voodoo, they're going to, you know, do the sequence beating of the veves. They're going to paint certain things. A lot of their folkloric so songs are about the loa. So that became the connection. So that began to inform their voodoo. And since they had nothing that they could really say about us because we couldn't, we wouldn't tell them anything. Right. Then they would say, okay, well, all of this came, since we can't find an existing tradition in Louisiana, all of this came from Haiti and it came into Louisiana and, you know, Haiti had to come and reawaken whatever the enslaved Africans had because it, it had all gone away. And it didn't go away. It's just, we didn't give you access to it. And we still don't really give you access to it. You know, at this point, we may be talking about like a folkloric presentation or kind of getting the history straight, but it doesn't mean that everybody has access to the practice, you know? So um, can you refresh I want you to refresh that? Not only, but that's, that's the point that you got to that point where when they started saying that, you know, this was the real thing and Haiti had to come and reawaken. Mm -hmm. And then they had this 300 year anniversary. But as you mentioned before, voodoo was in New Orleans 100 years before the Haitian Revolution. Yeah. So we, we came in with our own traditions and you'll see that the traditions are different. You do not have any history of priestesses dancing with snakes in Haiti. As a matter of fact, they are coming from a more fawn based Dahomey. We are coming from a more Eve based of Lida. So we were the ones to come with the practices that we most recognize. And I'm not talking about, you know, when we think about the black community today, you know, we're, we're informed, we have access to the internet, you know, you can, you can read a lot of things about Haiti now. But think back to what you're, depending on your age, what you heard your grandmother speak about, or what you heard your, your parents speak about. Right. They were not speaking of the same things that we're talking about here with Haiti. They had very specific, you know, things, you know, things, grigri bags. They talked about voodoo queens. They talked about snakes. Uh, they talked about going to get different medicines. You know, they, they said certain terms. And those things don't parallel with Haiti for a reason. It's not that it came here and it became different. We came from our homeland to Louisiana with our own tradition that we maintain. And so by the time, you know, a lot, and a lot of people don't really, because they never explain it this way. So a lot of people don't really understand. By the time the Haitians got here, they had already been to Cuba for a few generations. So they did not come with Haitian culture. And then when you're talking about new people coming in, we're not so quick to begin to say, hey, I practice voodoo, you practice voodoo, let's get together. We really don't trust. We still don't. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't mix like that. We, we're with our own. If I don't know you, and, and you know, now mindset is a little different because we have internet and everything and people are just kind of used to that. But if I don't know you, you're not gonna find out about what I do. You're not gonna find out about what my family does. You could be living somewhere for 30 years and not find out about a person who is in your life that is practicing voodoo and everybody else knows about it, but you don't know about it because you haven't been brought into that inner circle. So they were not mixing and mingling like that. And then you have to look at who came in. You're talking about them coming from Cuba, having been there. So now they're speaking Spanish. They are now basically Cuban. And there are many uh, people uh, who are Cuban today that still will tell you, I have Haitian ancestry and I have Cuban ancestry. So by the time they got here, you're talking about largely a Cuban culture that came here. And then you have to look at, did the enslaved Africans come here and have a voice in that? Or would you be talking about more of a certain class of people? And would they necessarily come in and mix with us? We're, we're very uh, territorial people. 
especially when you look at Louisiana and especially when you look at New Orleans at, at that time, were very territorial. If you come here today, you'll see very territorial, very guarded, very protected. You know, you're only going to see so much until somebody invites you in. So they're not really mixing information in this way. So we have our, you know, Metro Leno, you know, lineage, and then they have their, you know, lineage coming from the font, which is not based on, you know, uh, the matriarch, right. you know, so you'll see even more, and, and not that, that we don't have men who practice voodoo and even men who lead voodoo here, but there's a big emphasis on voodoo queens, which is a, a title. It's not just, you know, I'm the queen of all, you know, voodoo that there's anything. Right. This is a title. It's, it's what you, when you're talking about voodoo in Louisiana, that is the title, at least the English title for priestess. So that's the reason why there's such an emphasis is because the, the woman, the mother, basically uh, has been in charge with, with keeping the tradition and passing it on through, you know, from mother to daughter, mother to daughter, and so on. And so, and, and that's, it's interesting and it's important to know, because, so for example, you talked about the matric plans and patrick plans. If people think about Haiti and you look at just true story, and you mentioned this in a different, um, when you were doing, on that panel discussion, mm -hmm. you did a couple of years back, there was the Aja Empire, mm -hmm. and then you had the Dahomean Empire. Now, people read about Dahomey, and you know, they, they've done movies about Dahomey, it became very, very popular. But when you talk about the Aja Empire that was dominated by the Efe people, mm -hmm. and then you have the Dahomean Empire that was dominated by the phone speaking people, and the phone people, the phone and Efe are ethnically related. Mm -hmm. But Dahomey, they invaded the yes. Aja Empire, they invaded where the Efe had their stronghold. Yes. And that happened after you were talking about how that happened after you had already, your ancestors and ancestors had already been enslaved here. Yeah. So the Ebbe had got here first. Dahomey invades, you know, the Aja Empire later on, and then they take over and take control. But then some of them get caught up, and a lot of them get sent to Haiti and so forth. So you had an Ebbe Vodou come over here mm -hmm. in New Orleans, in Louisiana. You had a phone based Vodou get to Haiti. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the differences with regard to that? Okay, so like you mentioned before, you were talking about that 300 year celebration uh, of the first uh, slave ship uh, that um, was documented to come into New Orleans. And some people suggest that that isn't the first one, but they're speaking of the one uh, that came from, they'll say Benin in 1719, but we're talking about Wida and we're talking about every culture. So that is, is, you know, we're the ones who came in and we're the ones who created culture. So when you look at the two different um, traditions, you know, um, you have to look at the nations of people who were there. So when we say voodoo, yes, it is in, in Louisiana, it is every base, but we also had Senegambia, we also had Congo, we also had uh, Nago, which would be your Yoruba. Um, and, but the, the largest, you know, would be the, the Ewe and the Senegambia and Congo. And we had some others as well, but when you look to Haiti, you know, they have, uh, you know, they're mostly Fon based. They also have Congo. Uh, they also have some Nago. Um, they also have, you know, uh, the uh, indigenous people who were already there. And a lot of that is accounted for in their voodoo as well. So um, also Igbo. Um, when you look at the two, like, and that's, I would say that when you're looking at any, anytime somebody says the word voodoo, hoodoo, or any word associated with what we do here in what we call the new world, you have to look at what nations of people were there. And that's gonna tell you what you basically have, because sometimes people will use all of these words interchangeably. Right. They'll say voodoo, hoodoo, you know, even in New Orleans, uh, uh, the, the movie Skeleton Key popularized the idea that, you know, 
there's voodoo in Haiti and hoodoo in Louisiana, but that isn't necessarily true. There's voodoo here as well. So when you look at the, the differences, um, you know, uh, you're looking at the different nations and then you're looking at how it's practiced. When you go to Haiti, you're gonna see uh, lots of larger group practices than what you would see here in Louisiana. Louisiana, we're very much, uh, like I said, territorial. You know, there is a lot of family practice, you know, as well. And not that you can't find that in Haiti because you do, you know, not everyone lives in Port-au-Prince. Not everyone lives, you know, in a major, you know, region where everybody's just coming out and, 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 and practicing this. Um, but you have to take into account the nations that were here and that's going to give you your pantheon and that's going to tell you because you have a couple of different components to the tradition you're going to have the cosmology you're going to have your deities you're going to have in louisiana we say la loa or voodoo um you're going to have your deities and you're going to have the devotional aspect of it you know what you do when you do ceremonies what you do when you go to your shrines but then you're also gonna have the medicinal aspect of it. And, and you know, it's come to be popularized as this idea of magic. Everybody's talking about magic and spells. Just to clear that we have no magic, we have no spells. This is the medicinal component. What we're doing anytime we're doing uh, spiritual work is we're looking at a situation, whether it be a physical ailment or whether it be a, a physical condition, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever, and we're, we're giving medicine from a holistic aspect. So not only will we heal the physical ailment or the physical condition, but we would also address it spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. That is the purpose. It's not to get anything that you feel like you might wish for. It's not to manipulate other people. You are looking at a condition, you are finding where it is imbalanced, and you're seeking to find balance in that tradition by way of medicine. So when we're talking about herbs, we're talking about uh, Grigri bags, we're talking about mojo bags, we're talking about how we fix dolls, the ceremonies we perform, the spiritual baths, these are medicinal. And so you have to look at how we do what we do, how they do what they do. You know, it's not going to be exactly the same. We have certain rules. We have certain protocols. They have certain rules and certain protocols. So somebody who has been initiated in Haiti cannot just automatically come to Louisiana and say, I practice Louisiana voodoo. And a lot of people think they can because they think that there is no hierarchy in Louisiana. They think that Haiti is something to respect. You come to Louisiana, it's a free for all. You can do whatever you want to do. You can self-style and create your tradition, if you if you may, you know, maybe if you have a leukemia initiation or an e initiation, then you could just claim Louisiana voodoo. That's not true. This has its own set of initiations, its own protocols, just like when you go to Haiti and then vice versa. A person coming from Louisiana can't just go to Haiti and assume that they know what they're talking about over there, you know? So you mentioned, and that's important because it's showing how voodoo in Louisiana stands on its own. You always talk about how it's a blood-based tradition. Yes. So how was that, with, for example, with regard to initiation? How was that with regard to that transmission from, for example, mother to mother to mother to mother? It's not about, sometimes people just say, you know, you get a reading, somebody say you're supposed to be initiated and so forth, but how does the process really unfold? <coughs> Excuse me. So you have to separate what is real and what is tradition uh, from money-making, modern money-making tactics. And with modern money-making tactics, everybody gets divination. Everybody is told you're supposed to be initiated. Everybody is told they're supposed to be initiated to a priest or priestess. You know, there's thousands of priests and priestesses in all these traditions now. And it was never like that. If we were all properly within our culture, we wouldn't have to go and find somebody to initiate us. That would happen within the family, you know, as was the case for me. But that's not what can happen with everybody because everybody's family 
may not have remembered all of these uh, rights, all of this information. Maybe you have, you know, uh, components of it, but you don't have the component that shows you how to, to pass this down. So even though we have to kind of operate in a different way now, because everybody doesn't have a mother or grandmother, a father or grandfather who passed this to them, when we do the divination now, I still have to be able to read that this is what you're supposed to be in. And we can't take that for granted. You can't just say, I'm interested in voodoo. I had a dream. I feel called to it. We can't take it for granted that this is where you're supposed to be. Your bloodline may be somewhere else and lead you to a different, you know, um, part of the, the traditions. So whether you're getting initiated by somebody else or not, it has to be such that if your mother had been able to initiate you or if your grandfather had been able to initiate your grandmother, it would still be in your bloodline. And so it still has to be that way now. So the truth is most people do not need to be priests and priestesses. We all have a different thing that we need to do. I mean, some people need to only divine. Some people need, only need to work with herbal medicines. Some people only need this to become a better you know, version of themselves, a more healed version of themselves to protect them from early death. Uh, to protect them from major ailments that, you know, uh, would be coming as a result of the trauma in their bloodlines, you know, it may make you the best seamstress that you could be. It may make you the best bricklayer that you could be, you know, it may make you the best mason that you can be, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to do the same role because we need everything, you know, uh, as I'm going through some house things right now, just the, the, the number of people that don't know how to do work in a house, you know, it kind of lets you know, we, we put too much focus on certain things and not others. We need a wide array of people with skill sets to, to make a community and to make it function. And the same thing, just as it would be that way in kind of our mundane lives is that way in, in voodoo as well, you know? Like you mentioned, uh, for example, Ogu being the divinity that governs iron and blacksmithing and so forth, and he's a patron divinity, mm -hmm. but that also has to do with, that doesn't mean everybody who's born under that force has to be a priest. I mean, right. they need to be a blacksmith. Yeah. <laughs> so they can, you know. Yeah. So part of the thing is when you, when you receive divination, there are a host of things that come up as a skill set, a talent, or a gift under that particular energy, you know? Um, you know, you may be, uh, for instance, under a particular, you know, uh, energy, you may be a, a hairdresser. Under that same energy, you might be a priestess and a diviner. Under that same energy, you may be uh, a dancer. You know, um, there's different, different things that you can be, but when you're looking at the energy, you're looking at the, the essence, you know, if that person is, you know, one of its, one of that person's main functions would be to uh, communicate, you know, um, to present information and to bring information to people, especially if they're the type of person who usually comes up with, with new ideas great ideas and nobody else can see it before they see it. That person is meant to be a messenger and bring something out. It doesn't mean that everybody has the same message right. or that they have to do it in the same way. It just means that that is their energy. And so the work that they do in some way, they're going to carry out that function, you know, in the way that's best for them. You have to look at who they are. You have to look at what blood circle they're born into, the specific uh, family conditions uh, going on, you know, and, and where they are in their incarnations. You know, the person that you're going to be, you know, lifetimes later is not the same person that you were lifetimes before. You should be <clears throat> elevating and moving forward and advancing every time we come into uh, a lifetime and we gain experience. We shouldn't be coming into a lifetime <clears throat> just to 
experience, learn nothing from it, and have to come back still, you know, unaware. So you have to really look at where you are and you have to be comfortable being who you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to show up in this life. When that is given to you in divination, that is the best possible outcome for you. If you do that, you will avoid a lot of misfortune. You will avoid a lot of illness. You will avoid a premature death. You will avoid a lot of conflict and confusion, even with other people, by just doing everything you can to get into your own particular function. And then that's your contribution to the community. To the whole, yeah. Doesn't mean that everybody has to be a divine. <laughs> exactly. So um, in your, you often talk about in your work, and you just talked about how certain things are passed down, but people often use the term generational curses. Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with healing generations. Even just like you're talking about, well, if we look at the pandemic, so-called pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, all the people who were kind of ridiculing ancestry religion and practicing culture for years and saying, why are y'all doing this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. When that happened and 75% of the world is shut down because of this hybrid so-called virus, mm -hmm. and they had to come to the people who are dealing with holistic health to see how can they be assisted? Right. That's you know, a major contribution to moving the community forward or protecting them. But like you were saying, you know, if someone is a messenger, the message that they receive, it may benefit the entire community, yes. not because they are priest or priestess, but they receive a certain message, they implement that, they live in harmony with order, that benefits the entire community. It may keep the community from, you know, allowing a certain water, you know, watering um, hole or river or a well to be poisoned because they got the proper message. They weren't a priest or priestess, but they they listened to their <clears throat> cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. Mm -hmm. But then we have uncultivated ancestresses and ancestors, mm -hmm. <laughs> which sometimes people will say, hey, you're gonna set up a shrine, write down the names of all of your ancestors and ancestresses and call mm -hmm. on all of them, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, they're talking about generation curses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are you, what is the, the notion of a healing practice that deals with generational quote unquote curses in the real sense? Okay, so when we start talking about ancestral uh, reverence or ancestral work, when we start talking about ancestors, we need to, we become aware of all of the ancestors, but we don't necessarily treat all ancestors in the same way. So you're gonna have your more elevated, cultivated ancestors, the ones who knew the tradition, who passed the tradition, you know, um, the ones that we go to, to get information, to get insight, to get guidance. So that's, that's you know, a certain category of ancestors. Our, what I like to call our beloved ancestors, not that they're, not, you know, the others are not beloved as well, but. The beloved ones, I just refer to them as that because, you know, we knew them in life. You know, they could be our parents, our grandparents, and so on. Um, we still have a, a, a very close connection to them because we knew them in life. They may or may not be in that category. You know, they may be someone who can, can inform you and they may not be. And very often, whenever you have ancestral communication, you may get it through the voice or the, the feeling or the image of a beloved ancestor because that is what is being sent to you so that you could recognize that as an ancestral message, you know, but it may actually be coming from other ancestors. But since that person also carries the bloodline and you're familiar with that, that face or that essence and you trust that essence, then you may receive it in a dream from that particular person with that face, that energy. You may smell uh, a familiar smell of, of, of a certain ancestor's uh, perfume or you know, how their house used to smell because that's what lets you know, hey, now I'm talking to my people. But then we all have ancestors who did things on earth and even some of the people that we love very much, it doesn't mean that every single thing that they did was honorable and it was it was right. We need to know what, 
what these are. And this is something that I, I get uh, my initiates to do. And usually, you know, it becomes, even just that step becomes so heavy that they may rethink the whole process. But I, I get them to write down, you know, we write down all the ancestors that we know, good or bad, you know, um, and we look at some of the characteristics. Tell me any story that you can remember about them. Tell me their traits. Tell me something good they did. Tell me about their addictions. Tell me about their habits. Tell me about the things that we're not so proud of. And so when we start to tally things up and we start to look, we can see, okay, there's a history of molestation in my family. There's a history of, you know, alcohol addiction. There's a history of all of these different things in my family. And that, that becomes very heavy to people. But we need to know this right. because we need to know what we're up against here. What, what, what exactly do we need to be healing? We can, we can all go to the altar and we can, can do this practice. You know, we can call out our ancestors. We can leave food offerings. You know, we can make the altar very beautiful and everything. But we need to be working here. We need to be working towards an aim. So in doing this, what we're really asking for is we're asking for constant awareness. Show me, show me what I need to see. Show me what I need to know about myself. Because if you want to know about yourself, sometimes it's not just about your everyday thoughts. Sometimes it's not just about the things that you know or the things that you're most proud of to share with people about yourself. You have to look to those ancestors because I can promise you, there is nothing unique about you, as hard as that might be to hear. You're not unique. You are the, the latest vessel of all of this information. Everything they knew, everything they thought, everything they hoped for, everything they you know, wanted you know, for the, the future, you, you hold that. So since this is not unique, since these ideas, these thoughts, some of these damaging behaviors, some of these talents, you know, we, we're talking good and bad. Since this is not unique to us, let's learn. We can intellectually learn about our ancestors by asking questions to family members, but then we can also do our spirit work and we can have those ancestors inform us now from a more enlightened perspective. Now, from a knowledgeable perspective, they can inform us. They can show us things that we would not be able to see normally. This is why we go to the altar. This is why we go into trance. This is why we have ceremony. Not to, you know, feel some kind of way about ourselves. Not to say, oh, hey, you know, I'm better than you. I don't have my church hat anymore, but, you know, I got my tea on and, you know, right. I'm doing this. It's, it's, it's not really that. We want to, if you've been in tradition for years, we want to see ourselves healing past the things that have blocked us healing past the things that have held our ancestors and our elders back because we may still have elders that are living that are going through a lot of traumatic things and we want to we want to see ourselves get an understanding so we can push past that and, and the miraculous thing that you'll notice is that in your living you know family you may have somebody that's, you know, been addicted to drugs or addicted to, um, you know, um, alcohol or whatever. You may have somebody who has been mentally ill, you know, for most of their lives or all of their lives. And when you start doing this work, you don't really have to tell them about it. You don't even have to involve them. But because you are shifting things within your own blood circle, because you are working with those ancestors, you'll actually start to see some of these people that you thought, didn't have any hope you'll start to see them transform you'll start to see them heal it's real you know it's it's not theoretical it's not just you know hey let's get together you know it's not like a almost a kwanzaa type practice where we're like okay let's do our prideful you know black culture thing here it's actually you know we can apply this we can utilize this and we can see real results from it like you will not see in therapy. And I'm not against anybody, you know, uh, seeking whatever help that's available to them. But in therapy, you can get an intellectual understanding of the problem. You can kind of go back and forth with it. You can ponder it. But there is a heavy energetic component that will not be lifted in therapy. That is something that must come from our tradition. So we're dealing with the intellectual. We're dealing with the emotional 
we're dealing with the spiritual and that heavy energy, we're moving that so that we can actually have the result here. Not 10 years down the road, we make a realization about ourselves. We can start transforming things and see a difference in a few months, you know? And uh, you mentioned in that it's, it's become more popular, especially even amongst our people who are talking about spirituality or, you know, different expressions because they'll look at science and neuroscience and other things. They'll talk about epigenetic memory yeah. and, how things you know that we, we pass down through our dna and, and certain behavioral patterns and so forth mm -hmm. manifest now we've always had that in the tradition yeah so it's like you're saying with regard to you can become aware of certain things and even if you're dealing with certain therapists also neuropsychologists and so forth they can talk about certain things but sometimes the patterns like you were saying they're not just patterns because it's epigenetic even though that's a component of it sometimes the pattern from generation after generation after generation it's a crooked, you know, discorded ancestral spirit that nobody has removed. Mm -hmm. So they keep pressing somebody to molest this child. Then they mm -hmm. press the next person, molest this child. And you'll see generations of molestation, that mm -hmm. one spirit that needs to be moved out the way. Mm -hmm. But since people go to church, they just don't know. They don't know how to deal with that. So mm -hmm. when you're doing the divinatory practice as far as generational curses, mm -hmm. you're also dealing with the dealing with those specific spirits that are creating patterns that are just not just biological. Absolutely. So when we're looking at divination, we can see what's happening with that person. We can also see the spirits that are around them for, for good or bad. We can see the divine forces of nature that are speaking through divination and they're informing us of exactly what that person needs. That person may need a closer relationship with that specific you know uh energy that specific will do that specific la lawa um they may need uh to have a shrine they may need to have a certain medicinal practice done you know uh, by way of that particular energy to bring them back into a certain alignment but our traditions are so great and so advanced you can be a person that has an intellectual understanding of everything that's happening, or you could be a very, you know, I don't want to say be offensive, but let's just say you don't have an intellectual and yeah. informed understanding. It's not necessary because the most intelligent to the person with, I guess, the most basic concepts in, in their minds can, can do this because you know, we can sit down and we can break it down scientifically. And I, I like to do that too. Or you can go to the person, I mean, think about it. Children are brought up in this, this tradition. You know, uh, illiterate people are brought up in this tradition. Very intelligent and maybe not so intelligent people were brought up in this tradition. They still have to understand their relationship with these energies, with these divine forces of nature. Whether they say, okay, well, you know, my genetics and blah, blah, blah. Maybe they can, can, can spill it out to you elaborately, or maybe they can. Maybe they can just say, I, I went to sleep. I had this dream. I saw, you know, uh, this bird in my dream and the bird did this and that. And, and, you know, it told me I need to do this. This tradition will still work. This healing will still work. This science will still work. This medicine will still work, whether you understand it all or not. So this is what we've always done it's not that we needed to have a lot of therapists you know if you look in traditional culture you're not looking at a bunch of you know uh, board certified therapists but we had our tradition we knew how to bring people back in balance when they have fallen out of balance and even when you're born you need ceremonies to, to start you on the right path you know if we were in our culture we would not have a lot of the misalignments a lot of confusion um, we should not be 30 and 40 and 50 years old, still don't know what we want to do with our lives. We don't know what we want to do for a living. That's right. ridiculous. Right. We should have, our parents should have been told that when we were born, maybe even before we were born, and they should have been training us for that and preparing us for that when we were children. And so by the time we reached uh, puberty, we were off to our path of, of doing that and at some point doing it at a professional level where we can, you know, uh, earn a living and, and maintain, you know, households, you know. 
So, you know, that's the, the, the great thing about this is you look to the divination and that's, you know, one thing we don't ever, you know, sometimes people say, well, can you give me something for this? Can you give me something for that? Well, first of all, I don't really know you to that degree. And I might know you, you know, I'm familiar with you, but I don't know your situation until I look to divination. I'm not going to rely on my opinion. I'm going to go into the spirit realm and we're going to find out what's being advised because what worked for one person might not work for you. You may ask you, a lot of people might come and say, oh, I'm having financial trouble. Can you give me something for money? Well, I don't know what's going on with you. You may have, you know, um, you may have a family history of people who did not manage money well, you know, um, who, who maybe you grew up feeling very much in lack. You're used to things being taken away from you, you know, that, that you need. You're used to seeing your parents have things taken away from them that they need. That's a very different energy than somebody who's just, you know, who's just short in their money and they kind of want some extra money because they want to do something, you know, extravagant. Those are two different things. So first we need to even see if it's a spiritual problem. You might just need to go work or you might need to, you know, <laughs> yeah, you might need to just do that. But right. if you're having something that is, is hindering your survival, then we would look and see is there something deeper going on here that needs to be shifted so that you can start operating in a way that you don't have these problems? So, and, that, and that goes to what you're saying about the, the nature of the energy complex of a divinity, whether you know it or not. So for example, people are talking about, they've done a lot more studies on melanin, for example, over the past 25 years, a lot of people are talking about melanin, melatonin, serotonin, and, and the sunlight stimulates the pineal gland and secretes serotonin and that, that gives you that external aggressive kind of energy. But whether you know any of that or not, if you go out in the sun, that force of nature is gonna stimulate that process. The secretion is gonna happen and you're gonna respond, whether you can intellectualize it or not. Is it? So that goes to the point of, when we talk about the voodoo and you always say, nobody can give you a divinity. Yes. And people like to try to pretend like they can hoard these deities like it's Aladdin and Aladdin. And they can sell it to you and they can give it to you or, or you know, for our people, we think we don't have anything. You know, we have to go to somebody to get something. We have to mm -hmm. either go to Haiti or Cuba mm -hmm. or go to Brazil or, or go to Guyana or go to Nigeria, Togo, Benin, wherever we have to go because lowly African Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Afro Akani, Afro Akani people in America. Clearly we couldn't be born with a divinity, but what is the providence of the Vodou? How do we receive a divinity? When we talk about a deity that governs the head, a spirit that governs the head, where does that come from? So we have to first understand where did this come from, this idea of someone giving you uh, a deity or giving you a spirit versus you're born with this and ritual processes are necessary to help you to open up certain things and tap into certain things in a way that you might not be able to figure out just on your own. Um, this began all the way back in West Africa, this idea of selling spirits. So when we get outside of ancestral tradition, when we go to different parts of West Africa, you have people who may be Muslim, you know, especially Muslim, but also Christian. And to some degree, they still practice remnants of traditional culture but they relegate it down to kind of a menial practice. Like, you know, there's Allah, there's Jesus, you know, there's the main thing that they do, but then they relegate this down to a problem solving tactic. Okay, so I'm gonna, now I'm gonna deal with my river spirits and now I'm gonna deal with, you know, my uh, tree spirits or, or whatever from my family. And I'm going to make the spirit, meaning I'm going to create you know, a pot or a vessel, and I'm going to put all of the, the natural things, the natural implements for this deity. I'm going to do rituals, and I'm going to give it to somebody, usually a person that cannot hold this spirit on their own. And remember, these spirits are based on bloodline. There's no real thing of giving a spirit and having that, you know, that energy work with a person that does not hold this in their bloodlines. And if there's a way by which you're doing that, Basically, you're giving of yourself for another person to utilize in some vampiric manner because it's only ever in you. So whenever there's an actual 
initiation, we're talking about bloodline here. What we're doing is we're awakening what is already there and we're aligning you in a certain way because there's there's infinite ways we could go we can come into this world and we let's say we have a path that we need to take there's infinite ways we can go and often infinite ways that we do go based on upbringing based on environment based on past trauma all of these things become roadblocks they they you know uh take us off on different paths that we were never meant to go on. There are certain experiences that we've had that we were never meant to have. And if we hadn't had these experiences, we wouldn't have half of the problems that we've experienced. But that's what happens when we fall outside of our traditional culture. That's why your, your tradition, it insulates you, it protects you. So when you come into this world and you go through all of these different things, the trauma that you incur create blocks for you. They create different roadblocks. They hold you up. They don't allow you to get the, the information that you need to go about your path. They don't give you the inclination to become a part of the things that have you going about your path. And a lot of times they'll give you an affinity for things that are actually harmful for you, but you experience it as pleasure because of your trauma. So it may be that you have addictions to certain things. It may be that you have obsessions about certain things. That could be drugs. That could be alcohol. That could be sex. You know, that could be, you know, the wrong types of food, the wrong types of places, environments, things like that. You're so pulled by these energies that you're distracted from your path. Even if you kind of know, like, this is what I should be doing. How many times have we heard people say, well, I know I should be doing this. But so then why aren't you doing it? You know, you need the right amount of energy to be able to do certain things. And so sometimes, you know, um, you know what people have popularized this idea as uh, chakras, but they're really the houses of the voodoo. They're the houses of the divine forces of nature. Those things need to be properly aligned. We must have a constant communication. We have, must have a constant give and take we must have a relationship with these energies within us. And based on our experiences, our upbringing, we're not always in a position to do that. So just imagine somebody, I mean, think about your, your beloved ancestors and elders that have been in church forever. You know, when they're having these um, experiences, these spiritual experiences, but then every authority in their life tells them that, you know, this is not of God and, you know, um, this is the devil and, you know, this is, you know, um, a spirit on you. We got to get off of you. And then you go to the, the medical industry and they may be telling you, okay, you're experiencing a lapses with reality. You're experiencing mental illness. They have no way of knowing that they actually came here to be a diviner. So now more than ever, we need that kind of guidance. We need to be back in our traditions. Even when we're talking about being in tradition where that's untampered with, there's still things that can affect it. But now, I mean, we're living in such chaos, something so far outside of, you know, who we actually are and what we should actually be doing for the betterment of ourselves. We need constant guidance. And as to where you may go to different places in West Africa that, you know, and I can't even really say that because even with them, they have had their traditions tampered with. They ha they've had them uh, changed, destroyed by, you know, outside uh, concepts, uh, Islam and also uh, Christianity. They've had, you know, their traditions. So even when you go there and you say, I'm going to be initiated in the original, you're not dealing with the original. You're dealing with what was left after it's been tampered with. So really, when we look overall, we all have to go through this purification process that you've been talking about. You know, um, we all have to get back on path because we all have to actually discover what our culture is. You know, when I'm in Nigeria, um, most people, they treat, they treat the traditions just the way that we treat them over here. When we're talking about um, black folks over here, largely 
we're talking about the people who will go to other traditions. They may be Christian, Muslim, and you know, now you got a bunch of new agey stuff, you know, some people consider themselves to be Buddhist and everything else, but then they'll come to our ancestral traditions, you know, um, as a problem solving tactic. That's the same thing that's happening in, in Africa right now. So you do have a, you know, some people, a minority of people who only practice, you know, like in Nigeria, who only practice Ifa, who only practice Isheshe. But most of the people, they practice it to some extent, mostly for problem solving reasons. And then you'll also look and they're representing what they're doing in church. Are they represent? They're practicing, you know. Uh, they're observing Ramadan and all of those things, you know. So this is a global problem. This is not just oh, we forgot our stuff and everybody else remembered theirs, and we have to go to them to get that. Everybody, every this is a a, a global black problem. Absolutely. And you find if you travel to Ghana, you go to Ghana, for example. You're driving, you know, you can you can spend days in Ghana and never see one white skinned individual, except you'll see multiple billboards of that fictional cartoon character Jesus all up, you know, all down the roads. So um, and that that's exactly why Etchi sign is important. We're talking about when we were forced over here, we talk about the 300 year, you know, anniversary. And it's around that time, especially in Ghana. Um, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, Gabon, Senegal, and so forth, um, Sierra Leone, and region of Liberia, and so forth. Most of us around the, you know, somewhere around the so-called 1700s and up around that period is when most of us were forced into the Western Hemisphere. So by the time we, when we left, the tradition that we had when we left, that's the tradition that was passed down generation after generation after generation. Now, what's happened to them since we left 300 years ago, and especially over the past 100 plus years when they, you know, incorporate the fictional character Muhammad and the fictional character Allah, these are fictional cartoon characters, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Buddha, Brahman, these are fictional characters never existed of any form, any race, and we've pr proven that in our books and so forth. We've done the research on that, but they've incorporated that, especially over the past 100 plus years, heavily, but we were already gone. So the tradition that we brought over 300 plus years ago, that's the Akan tradition we passed down, the Ebe tradition we passed down. That's why Etchi sign is important because we're returning back to the tradition we preserve in our blood circles for the past 300 plus years here. Everything that we had, we brought with us. In addition to that, we you know, acclimated ourselves to this region of the Earth Mother and so forth, and we've taken on new information. So um, I just wanna say, uh one quick thing um, to that, um, speaking of, you know, us bringing over that older tradition here, it's kind of frozen in time. So when we look, you know, in Louisiana, and I'll say even in the rural areas of Louisiana, even more so than the city, and I'm referring to New Orleans, New Orleans has, is, is you know, when you, when you hear about voodoo, you think about, you think about New Orleans, um, and, you know, for good reason, it's a port city, you know, you're not really going to hear about all these little small towns in Louisiana, but if you were to go there, go, the, the, the tradition is going to be preserved to a higher level because these places are insulated. There isn't outside culture coming in. So if you were to come to New Orleans right now, you would find just as many people uh, talking about uh First, the big thing was Santeria back in the day, you know, you're talking about like the 60s and, 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 and on. Then Lukumi, you know, then later Haitian voodoo, then later people started going to uh, West Africa. So you'll hear, you'll see just as many practitioners of that and, and when you mention the word voodoo, they'll start to, you know, show you their elekes and they'll start to, sh you know, share that tradition, usually the, the Orisha tradition with you because this is a place, it's a port city. Everybody comes here, it's, it's being influenced. But then you still have your people um, and these are not the people that you would often see just out and about presenting themselves, you know, as, you know, I do this, you know, call me and inbox me and, you know, right. um, this would be, you know, the people that you don't usually have access to. They may practice still a more purified 
version of the tradition because it's it's isolated and it's insulated in a certain way. And, and your family is from that that tradition. Yes. So, okay, we want to we're gonna take some questions. We want to post some questions in the chat room. Um, but I do want to ask this question about. So you were talking about how, you know, we receive. Well, we're born into the world. We come into the world with the spirit that governs the head. So specific force in nature governing you. Of course, you have spirit, genetic, blood, ancestors, and ancestors. So you have the divinity. You have the ancestral spirits. You come in with something. And you were talking about how we need to, even through these bloodline, bloodline cleansings and purifications, mm -hmm. that's a major part of your spiritual work mm -hmm. to realign people with order so we can move harmoniously as a community. Sure. Now, some people <laughs> will say that, you know, that's not the purpose of the tradition is to realign people in the blood circle, the clan divine order. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, then you bring prosperity to yourself. Mm -hmm. Their thing is, if you're making a lot of money, then that means you're doing the tradition right. And if you're not making a lot of money, not Notwithstanding the fact that the, all the criminals make all the money, yeah. <laughs> that includes, you know, Bezos and Elon Musk and all these, you know, White and Earl Spring, the mafia, whoever it is, they make all the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So you can't equate, you know, spiritual development and truth of spiritual cultivation with how much money you're making. But some people have utilized the same prosperity gospel nonsense that you see with the churches. Mm -hmm. They flipped that and brought that into the Odu tradition to say, you know, if you follow us, buy our candles and buy our, you know, mixtures and so forth, mm -hmm. you'll be prosperous. Mm -hmm. If you're not prosperous, then you're not doing it right. And only the people with money, there's a prosperity pseudo gospel thing happening. Sure. <laughs> so, so speak to that. So uh, I did see somebody ask about the difference between voodoo and hoodoo, and we're going to get into it. Um, but just know that right now, when we're talking about public perception, you can kind of use both of those terms because people use both of those terms to market this to us. So just like everything else, you know, I used to uh, do natural hair. When I did natural hair, you basically need oil and water. That's how, that's what you do with black hair, right? Oil and water, very basic. Our grandparents had more hair than many people have now, just based on very simple techniques. But then the natural hair industry caught on to that and say, oh, you need this kind of jelly and this kind of butter and this kind of, you know, uh, hair care pudding. You have to have this if you want to make your natural hair work out. So they understand that there's a certain way that you can market to us. And because many of us, number one, we, we tend to, just as a people, not every single person, we tend to have a lower self-esteem based on the oppression that we faced and based on the white supremacy that we've suffered all this time. We have a lower self-esteem and we know something is missing. And since we, all of us don't necessarily have a way to connect back, we don't have a source of information that's available to us, we think it comes from buying products and that's what's been fed to us. So, you know, now we have a culture of conjure shops, botanicas that market these, these things, voodoo, hoodoo, and, we have to understand that what they're marketing is very different than what the tradition actually is. Our tradition here, you know, not, not in, in, in our homeland nor our origins here on this land, did things start with a conjure shop or a botanica. You have everything you need to practice your tradition with you, within you, around you. You can u utilize the water, you can utilize the herbs and the land and the soil. You know, I'm sure you can find a way to make a fire. There's air around you. You could burn some herbs and create incense. You don't need to go shopping to these places, but because our culture, whatever we get into or whatever we realize about ourselves, whether it's hair care, whether it's clothes, whether it's shoes, whether it's purses, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, church. Uh, and now when it comes to, you know, voodoo and hoodoo, oh, you need these products. The more stuff you accumulate, the more serious you are about your voodoo or about your hoodoo. So it doesn't, it's not difficult for somebody to realize, hey, if I 
just find a way to market this. And I'm very diligent about marketing these products. And I really make people believe they need this to be practicing their tradition. You can make money, whether you do it by way of, of, of crooked means, or even if you're being, you may be sincere about it, but you being sincere about it doesn't make it accurate. You know, and I'm not talking, I'm not saying, you know, I make certain things that I sell sometimes. I'm not saying that nobody can do that, but that should not be the um, the basis for which we judge if we are in alignment with our traditions or not, or if we're successful um, with our traditions or not. Anybody can make money. If you're willing to put the focus and the time into it, anybody can make money. You can go make money outside the tradition. You can find ways to make money within the tradition. You can find ways to make money by you utilizing everybody's ignorance of the tradition. There's many ways to make money. That has nothing to do with whether you are in alignment or, the, or if it's not a measurement of if you're doing something right. Anybody can do that. And so what we have to do now moving forward, we're not looking just to be consumers anymore because people know they can do that to us. They know that we're looking for something. They know that very often we feel uh, empty or we feel not enough. And if we just get this new this or this new that, or we just have this next latest thing, we'll feel a little bit better about ourselves for an amount of time. If we can get past that, we need to understand that our tradition has to do with our connections to spirit. It doesn't have to do with any products. It doesn't have to do with anything that we can purchase. And even if you decide to do that, because there are plenty of people that are making uh, holistic products that you can utilize, but anything that you buy is a luxury. It's not a necessity. And when you buy it, I would suggest you find out who's making it, how they're making it, you know, what types of things should be made in mass production and what types of things should be made on an individual basis, because when somebody comes for spirit work, I can't give them something that I mass produce. I have to give them something that basically is like a prescription. It's specifically for their situation. You know, anything else is just kind of entertainment, you know? Yeah. That, that even goes to even dietarily. If you have two children, same mother, same father, and one child is allergic to squash and the other one isn't, it has, your, their diet has to be very specific or they end up in the hospital. You have to pay attention specifically to what they need, even though they're from the same blood circle. Yeah. So it's the same thing spiritually. Um, so if you want to post some questions in the chat room on the voodoo tradition, we appreciate that. That breakdown. Okay, yeah, somebody asked about. So we're going to get into the differences between voodoo and voodoo, but if you have a question on anything, um, just speaking to that, uh, before we get into the, the ultimate uh, differences, I just want to say that when you're looking at these terms, you have to realize that these terms have actual meaning, they have an actual origin, they have an actual history, and then they have the meaning that has been imposed upon them. Right. So very often, and this is within the United States, within you know, America altogether, or what is now America. And even when you go back to the continent, when you go back to Africa, they will use the word voodoo to, to speak of any ancestral and medicinal, I don't want to say magical because it's not magical, any ancestral practice, any medicinal practice, they'll just generically call everything voodoo. And then here in the United States, we'll see the same thing. Everything is just generically called voodoo or everything is generically called hoodoo. Even within Louisiana, everybody in Louisiana is not well informed on these distinctions. So some people will swear, I practice hoodoo. Or some people say, I practice voodoo. Not knowing that that is going to depend on what group of people your, your family your people, where did they come from? What groups of people did they come from? And what are those ultimate practices? Because it's very popular in Louisiana now, especially as, as things have, have gone underground, 
people will use voodoo as the word for the practice or the noun, and they'll use hoodoo. That term is like a verb. So she practices voodoo or you just got hoodooed, you know, that has become popular. So when you start to look at these terms, you have to look at the points in history that people were saying these terms and you have to look at the regions and you have to find out what groups of people were there because everything that's called voodoo is not voodoo. Everything that's called hoodoo is not hoodoo. And in Louisiana, you have largely a culture of voodoo, but it's been, you know, said that, oh, it's voodoo is hoodoo, the word voodoo is illegal, so we use the word hoodoo, and mm -hmm. so on. So that's the main thing, anywhere you go and anybody you're talking to, you want to find out that information. That goes back to what you said about how in Haiti, they, it was more so the artists that they would go to, because artists are, you know, they're expressive and they're mm -hmm. sometimes can be sensational, and that the aesthetic of the tradition is more important. So they mm -hmm. go to the ones who are doing something very, very big. But even in North America, like you were saying, I remember seeing a quote from Jelly Roll Morton. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, they asked him about voodoo. And he was like, well, a lot of people call it voodoo, but here in Louisiana, the people know they call it voodoo. He said mm -hmm. something to paraphrase it mm -hmm. because he didn't know the differences, mm -hmm. but that's what, and that was over a hundred years ago. So people, mm -hmm. and, and he's an artist. So mm -hmm. since he was a popular artist and became more and more popular after he transitioned, mm -hmm. people, well, Jelly Roll Morton said. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he so, becomes you know. the authority to, right. to a lot of people at that time. But the thing is, you still have to look at time periods. If you're talking about what happened in, you know, the early um, 1900s, you're talking about like 1920, 1930, mm -hmm. people may have very well referred to that practice as hoodoo, whether that's what it was or not, because we're talking about a certain time in history. Everybody needs to stop saying this word voodoo, mm -hmm. you know? And now they start to implement this new word that they could have gotten from elsewhere, but that became a popular term. Because like I said, this is a port city. So, you know, you hear about even the way that the music flows, you know, you got riverboats going back and forth to St. Louis. You know, you have people coming in and out, you know, uh, words like wanga, juju, things like that. All of these words are coming from different places and people are using all of these words interchangeably, you know? So now that we're informed because our ancestors, they, you know, especially we're talking about our most recent ones, we're talking about parents, grandparents, great grandparents, they had available to them what they had available. A lot of times they were very much in traditional practice, but they may not have been so informed of the proper terms about things because those things had to be kept quiet for their protection. So our, you know, elders, our ancestors now would pass on the tradition, but not tell you what the name is, you know? And then you also, as is the case in Louisiana, we speak Louisiana Creole here. So now you're talking about language barriers. You're talking about a grandparent who spoke only Louisiana Creole, which is different than Haitian Creole, trying to explain something to a grandchild that only now speaks English. Right. So now we've got a language barrier there, mm -hmm. you know? And certain things that they knew, even if they use certain colloquial terms, they knew the differences. And a later generation or two wouldn't know the distinction. For example, if somebody saw black people communicating and said, hey, this is my brother, this is my sister, we know that that's not technically accurate, but we're gonna mm -hmm. say it anyway. Mm -hmm. Even in Ghana, they'll say, oh yeah, which means brother or sister, but they know this is not my brother, this is not my sister. Yeah, you're not but, going to the same mother and father, but right. you see it the same. And we know, yeah. and we're gonna keep doing that, but somebody from outside looking in and saying, well, he has a lot of siblings. Yeah. And some may have, you know, some who knew would say voodoo or hoodoo are interchangeable, but they knew exactly, you but know, they knew the colloquialisms about. and they weren't confused, but at this point, some people, but we're gonna get into that. Um, there's a question. What is veve? Okay, so veves are the signatures of a spirit. So basically, it is a visual. Um, yeah, it's a it's a visual. You know, what we would call a signature. That's the best way to to explain it. Um, when we create certain things, we are marking space and time to call up the essence of that energy. So when we put down a certain veve, and the, the, the veve 
is going to be uh, very much symbolic of that spirit. And then there's certain kind of like geometrical, um, a certain geometrical formation that just this symbol or this signature in this proper alignment helps to bring about alignment in that environment. So even in your body, as you're looking at that, and, and that's why sometimes people will be drawn to them and they don't quite know why. They'll become fascinated with it. They may stare, they may almost meditate on it. And while they're looking at it, it is working as medicine in the body, you know, in, in the mind and so on. Um, so veves are something that, you know, we can draw them on the ground in ceremony. We can incorporate it into our clothing. And we did that a lot in Louisiana with patches, you know, uh, quilted patches that we wore on the body and also that we used uh, just, you know, um, in quilts and things like that. Um, also, uh, when you look at the ironwork, especially in uh, New Orleans, there's lots of ironwork. You see our veves there, which lets you know that we were present and that we were still aware. This is not something that we got off the boat and we just forgot. We, we've continued this. So each, you know, divine force of nature has its own uh, veve, and then there are variations of that veve because there's variations within that energy, and sometimes we refer to it as paths. So, for instance, let's say you have legba. There is legba, but there are uh, there are different paths of legba. So the way we we draw this veve may be different based on exactly what we're trying to. And I'll go ahead and say the, the, the word. What are we trying to conjure up? What are we trying to to? A lot of people say manifest now, but we you know we're conjuring. Where we're bringing something from, you know, kind of an idea, a thought, or something that is intangible, and we're making it physically tangible. And that's what we have to do. And the reason why we do so much ceremony, you know, we can intellectually say, okay, we have ancestors, we have spirits, but we're going to make it physically tangible so that we can begin to interact with it. Because as human beings, that's how we understand reality. We, we have an actual experience with it. We have very often a physical experience with it and then it computes to us as reality. So we're bringing something from a spirit realm, a mental realm, an emotional realm, and we're bringing it into a physical realm where we can interact with it. We can smell it. We can taste it. We can hear it. We can dance with it. It can you know be within us and, and, and we can feel the dance. We can feel the movement. We can feel the energy because it's happening within us, as is the case with, you know, spirit possession. And just to, just want to make that clear, when we're talking about spirit possession, we're not talking about some outside entity jumping on us and wrestling us down and taking over our bodies against our will. We're talking about something that's already within us, that through the correct, you know, um, you know protocols that we've placed by tradition, we're able to, to bring this up. We're able to make this you know, happen on a physical plane so that we can interact with it. And you'll find that, you know, just as Linda mentioned, the shrines in the body, some people talk about chakras like Karakaru and so forth, shrines of the deities, centers of resonance, just like we have shrines for the deities on earth, our organs and organ systems are shrines. The deities are forces in nature that embody divine order. And the same thing with spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors. So when they come through spirit possession, spirit communication, it's an orderly, harmonious communication. When you have these violent, you know, possessions and they're leading people to grab a cigarette and smoke it and doing all kinds of other stuff, you have uncultivated spirits of relatives as well as non-relatives who will enter into a fray just like if you're physical immunity is compromised and the microbes that normally bounce off of you throughout the course of the day can take you down. But if your immune system is strong, you can repel them without ease. But if your spiritual constitution, your spiritual anatomy is compromised, then those viral entities, viral discarnate, uncultivated relatives, ancestral spirits that are relatives, that are uncultivated, that class of uncultivated ancestral spirits, or non-relatives, just like a homeless person, you walk by a homeless person, some of them know not to approach certain people, but then some of them can tell some people are more receptive 
or weak and they don't have that kind of, you know, re repelling kind of repellent kind of power or energy. So they try to, you know, exploit that person. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing when they transition. Those kind of spirits, transient spirits that are still hanging around the place where they, I'm sorry, they transitioned and so forth. They would try to attach themselves just like they did when they were alive to those who are receptive or weak and so forth. And those who are not, they are repelled by them. So when you have those kind of individuals, even if they're unrelated and you allow them in, just like you allow some microbes in or bacteria in because you weakened your spiritual constitution, your spiritual community, then you have these kind of viral, violent, aggressive, vulgar, you know, spirit possessions. So every spirit possession is not the same. And, and let me say this, um, I see, I, I can't read it that well, but I, I, I see something about ancestral work, worship versus, versus deity, deity worship. worship. What we're experiencing whenever we're dealing with the uh, voodoo, whether we're dealing with the Orisha, whether we're dealing with the Abu Song, what we're experiencing, everything is ancestral. And that's why it's blood, connected you can't you can't really be in voodoo and, and you can't interact and experience them in, in that way without being blood connected but what we're trying to do we talk we're always talking about trying to get a purified version of this so we can all interact with ancestors and remember I said we've got all kinds of ancestors we got ancestors that did very low things and we have ancestors who had the very highest understanding and expression of our culture. So when we're talking about uh, ancestor worship, I think, or ancestor veneration or, or ceremony or any of that, and I think most of us understand what that is, when we start talking about dealing with deities, divine forces of nature, it's still going to express itself in a way that we recognize ancestrally. But we want to get to the most pure form of that expression that we can possibly receive. So that's the difference in, you know, whether we're doing certain initiations, we're doing certain forms of purification, where we're reaching, you know, this energetic expression at its highest, most purified level. Because, you know, sure, you can go to a ceremony somewhere and you can see, you know, you, somebody say, okay, well, this spirit got possessed by such and such. And that person who is now possessed goes around and starts slapping people and, you know, doing all kinds of chaotic stuff. That doesn't mean that that is the most purified expression of that energy of that divine force of nature. That could be a kind of a more lower level ancestor or for some people, maybe not even an ancestor, just a lingering spirit like we, we just got through talking about some wayward spirit. So what we're trying to do here, the aim of this is we want to get to the more purified, elevated version of that energy. That's what we, we, we contact and, and, and that's the reason why we go through certain protocols and protocols have stood the test of time. Culture has stood the test of time. Why do I need to sit and try to figure all of this out myself in the, you know, the years that I have here when I've got a history of ancestors who have already figured out, they've already done the, the footwork here. They know how to protect me. It's no different than, 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 just regular life. I was born, I came into this life to be a woman, but did I have the knowledge to be a woman as a baby, as a little girl? No, my mother had to show me how to be a woman. And over time, I developed the, the understanding and the consciousness. I developed, you know, physically to be able to be a woman. And I studied under my mother for years. I learned womanhood from her. I learned womanhood from her sisters, from her mother even, but it doesn't mean that I was ready to be a woman just because I was born to be a woman, you know? So that's the kind of the purpose of everything here. So we're looking for the purified version, you know, of that energy, not just any expression that may look similar to that energy. You know, many times we can think of one of the, you know, the uh, deities that we recognize as beauty and fertility and, you know, creative expression. And, you know, you think that anybody who is coming in expressing themselves in a feminine way, whether that be, you know, a high level of it, a low level of it, you know, you might think that that, that, is, that, that is that energy, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is that particular voodoo. 
So that's why the, the tradition is passed the way it is because we're trying to get to that pure energy. The pure the energy, the more it can balance us one way or the other. Why do I need somebody, whether a living person or a spirit to guide me in their misaligned? That was always a big problem I had when I was looking to uh, people who claim to be elders because you have a lot of people who are elders. They may know a lot of stuff, but look at their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if, if they're living some toxic life, you can't say overlook that. And, you know, it's, it's all good. That person carries a spirit. Right. Come on to the temple. Yeah. I need a purified as purified as possible. Nobody's perfect, but I need someone with good character to teach me. And that's kind of what we're, we're doing here. We're trying to develop that good character and we're trying to get the purified, you know, uh, part of this energy to uh, help to align us so that we can live as we need to live for our greater good. Requirements to practice voodoo. Oh, okay. So in the chat room, four people can see uh, what is required from a person to practice voodoo. Okay, so the first thing that is required is a bloodline connection. So you may be of African descent, um, but that alone is not necessarily an indication that practicing voodoo is your best bet. You know, um, we need a bloodline connection with those specific groups of people. Now, I'll say this, if you're somewhere and you have, you know, you have no other options and this is a, a thing between, you know, uh, voodoo and, you know, Christianity, sure, let's all, <laughs> let's all go to a voodoo ceremony. And that's kind of how we had to think of it, even when we came over here as enslaved people, because we had different nations, even here in Louisiana, we had different nations of people that make up these pantheons in the particular practices that we have here. So we're always more in alignment by doing, you know, something that is ancestral tradition. But ideally, we want to go back to the specific ancestry that we have and the traditions that they had, because in those traditions hold all the keys, all the specific medicine to undo all of this trauma and align us in a certain way, they have all the keys. Everything that you're feeling, everything that you're going through, that tradition has all the keys to fix it, whether we know it or not. So that's the first thing, the bloodline connection. So the first way into it is dealing with your ancestors set up your ancestor shrine you begin regular communication don't wait until you get a big pretty table or you know pretty lacy fabric or you know statues and everything don't wait for that begin the practice you can go by you know a tree and pour a few drops of water and start talking or you can have a shrine in the house which is can be very basic you know you begin that regular communication and that communication is going to let you know who you are you're gonna develop a relationship with those ancestors where you know that if you're having a spiritual experience, you're gonna know how to recognize a pull from your ancestors versus a pull from some outside entity that may not even be good for you, but you need a nice long relationship with them. You know, so I wouldn't go into a saying, okay, I'm gonna just, you know, uh, practice, you know, like whatever, whatever idea you think of, okay, now I'm practicing voodoo. I wouldn't really look at it like that. I would look at it as, let me develop a relationship with my ancestors. Your ancestors are going to lead you into more proper alignment. Then they're going to lead you to um, resources of information. They're going to lead you to teachers. They're going to lead you to people who can further guide you. They may even lead you to a diviner, you know, for certain uh, situations. The next thing would be after you have a strong relationship with your ancestors, which you know, that'll get you through the rest of your life, you know, but the more you can, can learn and the closer that you can get to this, then you start to learn about the divine forces of nature. You start to learn about the voodoo. The reason why 
very often we say, you know, it's good to be initiated before you begin to connect is because you've got to know this purified version of this energy, you know, and that happens, what, what's happening in initiation is there's lots of protection that's, that's happening around you. There's lots of purification that's happening. So we're sealing off all of the, the, the ways in which a lot of harmful spiritual activity can even reach you. It can't even reach you, you know, um, maybe you watch movies sometimes and movies can be very sensational, but you know, let's say somebody who has a gift of supposed psychic energy or whatever, and you see them always been bombarded by, you know, these different entities that they're not even connected to. Oh, I need you to, to, you know, go and talk to my granddaughter and tell her that the money's hidden in the basement or right. whatever, you know, that doesn't need to talk to you. That doesn't need to reach you. Not because you're not somehow gifted or talented enough for that to happen, but it has nothing to do with you. So you're sealed off to only deal. I don't want to talk to somebody else's, you know, um, unknown, you know, entities coming from anywhere on the street. I want to talk to my own ancestors. I want to talk to my own voodoo. And they will inform me of anything that I need to know that's going on. And if they're not informing me, it must not pertain to me, you know? So that's the process of this. So, so when you're doing your ancestor work or when you're, you're getting into this, mostly you're not yet familiar with everything. You may feel like any, any spiritual phenomenon, any, you know, extra sensory perception, you may feel like, oh, this is my ancestors. Oh, this is voodoo. And we see this all the time when people say, oh, you know, I'm, I've done this ritual to Shango. I've done this ritual to Erzali and this happened, everything. You might not be connected to Erzali. You might not be connecting to Shango. We don't know what you're connecting to. And that's why you get in the tradition and you have elders who can, can say, this is how it's done. This is what you should do. When something happens, this is how we we bring it back to where it needs to be because it's a big it's a big universe out there how do you know what you're connecting with until you have the experience you know how old were you before your parents let you go outside by yourself how old were you before they let you stay out till midnight they're not going to do that early on because you don't have the experience to know when you're in danger or not it's the same thing and if you don't have people in the tradition, in the family, that's why, again, you talked about starting off with the ancestors and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. Yes. And they're in, we, use, we utilize these English terms like the, you know, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. We have to say that because if we translated that into the traditional languages, there are classification between the spiritually cultivated class, those who are beloved, like was it in our kind of not unknown in some awful the spiritual cultivated ones, the beloved ones are the in some awful pot. But then you have in some in some mind body, which are the ones who is, you know, disordered, spiritually disordered. But you're dealing with ones who are cultivated and they give you that experience and that knowledge and that wisdom, and they they will direct you to people who are part of your spirit genetic clan, whether you knew that or not, they may be a distant, you know, distant. relative. But somebody in your clan is connected to that ancestral tradition, they'll make sure that you cross paths in Walmart or wherever you're at to make right. sure that it's not a, a, a chance happening, you know. And, um, and once you're familiar with how your ancestors communicate, whether they come to your dreams and they literally tell you in your dreams, whether you get a bad smell or a bad taste in your mouth or whatever discomfort that they may, um, that, that you experience in your body as a result of them giving you a message. They will take you away from what's bad, even if you're uninformed, even if you don't know. Um, many times they have kept me uh, out of harm's way. You know, I've been in this for a long time since I, you know, um, was a child. And so even when we're talking about branching out in my teenage years and early 20s, going to different people's uh, ceremonies, going to visit different people's houses, um, the possibility of getting initiated in other uh, traditions in the diaspora. They came to me and told me where I should and shouldn't be, you know, and when there was danger, when there was deception, you know, um, you need that because a person can tell you anything, but your ancestors, once you learn 
their form of communication, which may not be complete paragraphs, you know, of words. Right. It may be just an image, just a symbol. It may be just a word, but you have to have a relationship with them to know how they communicate so that when you get these communications, you can recognize them as such and not just think, oh, it's just, you know, I'm just, it's just my mind or, oh, that was a coincidence. You have to know this is my ancestors. And there are going to be multiple feelings, multiple signs that happen at once to let you know, yes, this is definitely an ancestral communication. Okay, so we're gonna take like a couple of minutes, short little break, it's 9.46. Um, and then we're gonna get back to talking about the hoodoo tradition. So it's 9.46, just, just about five minutes, take a quick five minute break, and then we'll be back on. Of course, you can post, you know, comments or questions in the chat room and five minutes, 10, I mean, 9.50, which for some, well, for us it's 9.50 for some of you, it's, is it 9 50 or is it is your is, oh i'm this, sorry it's eight uh... oh this computer didn't, it didn't okay. so for us it's 8 47 right now central time so just about five minutes and then we'll be back
Okay, so we're back. Um, just let me know in the chat room. Just want to make sure to check. Can you hear clearly? Can you see? Let me, anybody give me a quick notification. Okay. Yes. Okay, may I say we appreciate it. Okay, so, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some, uh, you know, just some questions and, you know, just points of clarity that I think would be good uh, for those of us who are serious about ancestral traditions to understand. Um, so, you know, uh, I know definitely for me, it bothers me that uh, people are so free with how they utilize these terms and how they, they speak of and handle and represent our traditions. And, um, you know, whether it be people outside of those of us who carry this in our bloodlines, presenting it to be, you know, traditions that came from all of these different origins where they minimize Africa and, you know, maximize, you know, some supposed European influence or, you know, uh, so-called Native American, you know, practices and things like that. So whether it be that or whether it be uh, those of us who do carry these traditions in our blood circles, but we've been conditioned to give a lot of respect and praise and protocol to other aspects of the diaspora, whether it be, you know, the Cuban-based traditions or whether it be, you know, the, uh, the traditions that are practiced on the continent now, will give all of this respect and, and distinction about how things should and should be. But then when we get to, especially using the word hoodoo, when we get to this word hoodoo, then it's just a free for all and everybody thinks that whatever they wanna add, whatever mix and mode, if they wanna add, you know, Goetia symbols or whatever, you know, crazy, right. you know, concepts they have, they think they can just say that it it's all under the guise of hoodoo. So could you clarify for us exactly what hoodoo is so that we can know what it is, you know? Exactly, and that, that's very, very important in, in general and specifically one of the reasons we have Echisan. So you talked about the, the nations of the people who brought these traditions into the Western Hemisphere. If you look at, even with regard to cosmetics, on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, Africa, as well as in the Caribbean, one of the number one selling cosmetics is skin bleaching. So that indicates, of course, low self-esteem. You think that the melanin recessive is superior, you know, melanin dominance is inferior and so forth. We've been conditioned with that for hundreds of years. And that's there, it's in the Caribbean. To a certain extent, it's here. We don't do a lot of skin bleaching here, but we do other things. So, Makeup and so on. Right, and, and, and worship of the white character who never existed. So, but that goes to self-esteem, but that self-esteem also shows up in the way we practice the things that, that we embrace, the things that we reject. Black people in America, we've been conditioned and it's different. You talked about in Haiti, for example, they had more open ceremonies. That had to do with the, to a certain extent, the manner in which enslavement was practiced. They would allow people of the same ethnic group to be enslaved on the same plantation, sometimes speaking a lot, being allowed to speak their language. Here in North America, there were smaller farms. They separated us. If you were from the same nation, they would send you to another plantation, send you to another state. They didn't want you playing drums. They didn't want you engaging in, you know, you know, large organized ceremony because they knew that led to revolt. Yeah. And they had evidence of that going back to the revolt of, you know, in the 1700s in New York. They were like, 20 plus people who were part, 21 people were part of that revolt in the 1700s. They talk, talk about the New York slave rebellion. Nine of them had our kind, they names like, you know, Kwesi and Faku and, you know, Kodru and so forth. So they knew that us getting together, practicing tradition led to revolt. So they would separate us, make sure we didn't engage in ritual, you know, smaller farms, no familial contact and so forth. As soon as the child is born, they take the child and send it to another plantation, you never see the child again. So certain things were, you know, separate. We've been acculturated like that in a negative sense for hundreds of years. So then when you're acculturated like that, you have a low self-esteem. So you believe because you weren't able to practice like that 
and then we're separated just even intellectually from the tradition to a certain extent. We'll look at Haitians or Cubans or Brazilians or you know, people in the Dominican Republic or Suriname will say, well, they maintain their traditions. They maintain, you know, who do they maintain, you know, Dukumi, they maintain Candoblé, they maintain Umbanda, and, you know, the Suriname tradition, the Winti tradition and so forth. But we've been conditioned to believe falsely that we didn't maintain the tradition. So we talk about in the Etchi sign conferences and so forth, we maintain our ethnic designations. For example, Voodoo, of course, is Eve, Eve term, as well as the phone with Eve term and so forth. So if someone said, you know, a couple hundred years ago, this is a voodoo man or a voodoo woman, they were identifying their ethnic. They were saying, I'm an Eve man, I'm an Eve man. Also, someone who's practicing the tradition, but they were identifying themselves as part of the Eve ethnic. If someone said, I'm a juju man or a juju woman, it wasn't just, oh, juju is quote unquote magic. Juju comes from the Yoruba term ju, which means to cast, to throw. If you're a juju man or juju woman, they were saying, I'm a Yoruba man, I'm a Yoruba woman. They knew what their ethnic group was in North America. If you said I'm a Wanga man or a Wanga woman, you were saying I'm an Ovambo man from Namibia, Angola today and so forth. You're casting the Wanga, throwing the Wanga. You knew exactly where you came from. You were identifying your ethnic group. If you said I'm a hoodoo man or a hoodoo woman, you are identifying your ethnic group. The ethnic group for hoodoo is the Akan ethnic group of Ghana and Ivory Coast. Now we're the first, we published an article over 10 years ago, the Akan origin of the term hoodoo. We show that hoodoo comes from the Akan term hundu, and specifically of the Akwamu Akan ethnic group. So you have uh, 26 plus million Akan people between Ghana and Ivory Coast. So you have millions of Akan people. The Asante or Ashanti people is a large Akan group. The Fanti is the next largest. There are millions of them. Then you have the Akwamu, a couple of million of Akwamu people. They're another Akan ethnic group. They were known for rebellions. St. John's Island, they took over the whole island for six months. The Akwamu Akan ethnic group, you had Akwamu people in North America. In Suriname, the Akwamu people were prominent and so forth. So, but in the Akwamu Akan dialect, the term for medicine, from roots, trees, plant life is Undu. In comparison, in the Asante Akan dialect, it's not undu, it's unduru, unduru, with the extra stem. But in Akwamu, it's undu, and that means medicine, specifically from the undua, it's pronounced undua, undria, which is trees, plant life, and so forth. So you have the undu from the undua, undu from the undria. It means medicine from roots, trees, and plant life. But undu also means to become heavy, as in heavy with the spirit, through spirit possession and spirit communication. And then undu also means to feel a presentiment or a foreboding. To feel something when the spirit is coming down, you become heavy, then you feel a presentiment or foreboding, what's about to take place, what's unfolding, and so forth. That is the undu. And we showed that in the article. You have the undu yefo, which is the, um, the root um, worker. You have the Undum Sinifo, which is the root doctor. You have the Udumafo, which is the diviner and so forth. So this stem, Undu, Udumafo, Undum Sinifo, Undu Yefo and so forth. We show all of that in our article, showing that Hudu comes from the Akan term Undu and it's, it's throughout the entire cosmology. You find it throughout the entire thing. Most people didn't know, until we put that article out, they were not able to identify the ethnic group that Hudu came from. So listening to white writers, <laughs> ethnographers and so forth, who said, well, you know, hoodoo is just a magical botanical practice. People did roots and herbs, they healed and so forth. And whatever you feel like doing, you just incorporate that and call that hoodoo. Every Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani, African and such religious practice has a class of ritual practitioners who deal with medicine. In Yoruba is the Onishegon, they understand the medicinal use of thousands of herbs and so forth. And Akan is the Odun Sinifo. That's literally the one who works with roots and herbs and so forth to make medicine undu from the roots and herbs. The Odu Yefo, ye means to make or to do or to act. The Odu Yefo utilizes medicine through action. So that's the conjuring. But the Odun Sinifo, they make medicine through roots, plants, minerals, and so forth. So every tradition has 
you know, a component where certain people are naturally inclined towards, you know, plant life and mineral life. It's like some people are naturally inclined towards um, engineering. If you look at the body, for example, look at the different divinities that govern different aspects of creation and they're connected to the body. So if you look at your skeletal system, that's the structural system. The divinity that governs the skeletal system, people who are children of that divinity, they're naturally inclined towards structural activities. Those people are naturally inclined towards engineering and so forth and different expressions. People who are um, governed by the divinity that governs the renal system that balances fluid systems in the body and mineral balance. They're naturally inclined towards bringing mineral balance and fluid balance in the communal body and they're healers and healers. Mm -hmm. So we, depending on the divinity that governs you, you have a specific set of activities that reflect that energy complex. But everybody has, every group has, you know, root work, yeah. <laughs> root doctors. That's, that's not what hoodoo is. In fact, root work is one eighth of the hoodoo tradition. Root work is one eighth of any tradition. If you have fire, water, earth and air, you have plant life, animal life, mineral life, Afrakani, Afrakani, human life and so forth. When you break things down, the medicinal aspect is part of the plant life aspect, so to speak, the root workers and so forth. You have the expansion and contractive aspects of that. You're talking about healing and root work for that. That's only one eighth of the tradition. But so we, we identified that hoodoo is from the Akan term hoodoo. We also showed in the language of ancient Kemet, hoodoo also means medicine for roots, trees, and plant life. Hoodoo also means to become heavy with the spirit, heaviness, and so forth. Hoodoo also has to do with spirit possession, spirit communication, a title of divinities. Undu also is the name for the ritual offering table in ancient Kemet, and the name for the ritual offerings are Undu. So just like we say we give our hudu to the spirits and so forth, in ancient Kemet, we show specific texts where they're talking about they give me their Undu, as written in the Medu to the hieroglyphs. We give our Undu to the deities to make sure that things operate in our divine order. So it's important when we talk about the ethnic group. Now, specifically, we talk about the Akan ethnic group giving that name. If, if the Asante people were the ones who made it popular in North America, if they were more dominant, we wouldn't be calling it Hudu. We would be saying Hudu. But since it was our Kwamu people, we say Hudu or Hudu. So that's that's the ethnic group. That's where it comes from. So there's a lot that you said that you know I can definitely relate to because it's the same thing in Hudu. You know. Um, there is the medicinal component, but that's that's only one thing. And I think uh, what's happened um, partially because of the way that we had to preserve and then also because of how we've been getting our information, there's kind of been like an overemphasis on the medicinal part and not uh, an emphasis really on any other part. And it's kind of been told to us now, you know, just thinking about the fact that most of the information that we have, especially we're talking about what's in books or what's been documented, those were written by white male authors, usually. And then when we look at even some of the newer books, you know, and, and publications that may be written by our people, we're still talking about them coming through the system of academia and not necessarily being a part of the practice right. itself, you know. So you know, there's a reason why we have this, this focus. And then, you know, when we look at the fact that not everyone can communicate with these deities, then we can also see why there's an overemphasis on, I have to have these tools, I have to have this thing. So what do you think about the fact that the hoodoo tradition in most people's minds, not in actuality, but just in people's minds and, and how it's been presented has just been reduced down to, you know, what you can buy to put something together to now practice your tradition. Right, and it's, it's, um, it's become epidemic. This is why we started to publish on, first of course, we have to have the experience and then we start the publication aspect of it. But fundamentally, just like any other tradition, when you understand that there's an ethnic foundation and the Akan tradition is the ethnic foundation. And we also get into the fact that the term mojo comes from the Akan term moja, the term jack or jack ball comes from the Akan term ja. So the mojo and the jack is the moja and the ejan Akan is the matriclan talisman 
connected to the matriclan deity. The Ja or Jack is the patriclan talisman associated with the patriclan deity. So it's a full cosmology. The Haint spirit comes from the Akan term Hinti. So we can go through every cosmological term in the Hoodoo tradition, look in the Akan language, and you will find every single term fully expressed with the exact same ritual connotations. Mm -hmm. So we can prove it in various different ways. But um, when you look at the, the way it's expressed, one of the reasons why initially the medicinal aspect was expressed or trumpeted, so to speak, as well as the sorceries, or what they would consider sorcery, because it was the most expressive aspect of the tradition with regard to enslavement because we were healing ourselves, we were curing ourselves, then we utilize the tradition to empower ourselves, to free ourselves from enslavement. When you give somebody a certain kind of medicine and they, you know, you have different sumine as they call it in our con tradition, talismans and so forth, that for hunters, for example, to avoid the animals from seeing you and things like that, or to overcome the shock of, you know, um, arrow points and, and bullet wounds, not that you, you know, they stop before they hit you. It's not like, <laughs> you know, a movie or something, but to overcome that shock so you can still move on. Um, that was the most expressive and to Europeans sensation because they would say this small group of individuals who wage war against us, kill the slave master, burn down the plantation, free themselves, go into, you know, a uh, uh, sovereign area like they did in Dismal Swamp and establish an independent sovereign state. We were waging war and we had that kind of confidence because number one, we could heal ourselves, which Europeans couldn't do. The state of medicine and medical practice for Europeans in the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s was no match for us. They had to come to enslave people to, for us to you know, heal our own people because they couldn't, they were still bloodletting and doing crazy nonsense, you know, even in the early 1900s. So when we look at homeopathy and natural medicine and the natural medicine movement, it came from people practicing, came from us. The so-called slave master would have to come to us to heal our people. Of course, we would do that. Then they would utilize that information. They saw us healing the other enslaved person and utilize that for themselves. And later it becomes the natural medicine movement. And they're making millions of dollars off. But it was the most expressive aspect of the culture was we could heal ourselves, we could purify ourselves, we could overcome illness. But then on the flip side, we can utilize that medicine to poison the so-called slave master, poison his staff, poison his family, you know, and engage in some kind of escape, you know, mechanism. So initially that was the most, that's the reason why it was, you know, put forward as the most prominent expressive aspect of the culture, it's the most sensational man. They can heal themselves, they can kill their enemies, they can free themselves. But we didn't lose sight of the cosmology. Now on the plantation, you need to heal yourself. I, you mentioned this in the film, I'm sorry. You, you had to heal yourself, but you also had to, you know, um, defend yourselves from the enemy. So those were very prominent. But we didn't have, we weren't sitting around just talking about cosmology on the plantation, even though we knew it intellectually. But the reason we come into the world is, is the great mother and great father, Nyamewa Nyame, as we say in the Akan tradition, the supreme being, the great mother and great father who work together as the supreme being. You have the forces of nature that animate all features of creation. And then you have the ancestors and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. And we align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order through the agency of the deities and ancestral spirits, just like cells in the body. They're children of a larger, larger you know, being, which is the organ. They live in harmony with that organ that they're a child of, and they support their parent organ or parent deity. The heart cell serves the heart as parent organ. Then it's serving you, the supreme being, at the same time. The liver cell serves as parent deity, as parent Vodou, as parent Orisha Abosam, then it's serving you, the great being, at the same time. So we are cells within the great divine body when we um, serve our parent divinity, then we're serving the supreme being at the same time. We're here to execute a certain function in creation. We knew that instinctively. So the healing practices and the you know ritual medicine practices to poison our enemies, that was most expressive, but then it comes into the, comes to the point, like you mentioned earlier, then when people lose or suppress, you know, conscious knowledge of the cosmology, all they're focused on is the healing aspect, as well as the defensive aspect. But then when the enemy comes in and starts trying to market certain things, 
and they're trying to push us towards fake traditions, then a lot of things get pushed to the side. And the only thing people have left are these practices. And then when they start, you know, studying pseudo history or listening to what you said about before Europeans just writing these different things, these academics, and then are people going to colleges studying under these individuals? They're getting a degree in anthropology, um, history. They'll get some kind of fellowship. They'll go to the continent. They'll study certain things. And they don't have any direct knowledge of ritual practice. So they can't make a decision. They can't assess whether or not this is accurate and accurate. If you're not engaging the divinity that you were born into the world with, the one that governs your head as well as your matric plan and patch plan divinities, if you can't engage or you're not engaging your ancestor spirits, spirit of the cultivated ones, then you're not fully aware in the tradition. And then things that people say you can't discern whether it's not whether it's accurate or not. And this is um in a way you can look at it and say, like, this is how we've been poisoned to the extent of it's almost as if they're what they could perceive, this outside perception has now become our perception, has become our limited focus, which is why sometimes, you know, or very often our people come to this just for the medicinal, you know, um, purpose. And, and, and most of the time when, when people do that, they're not thinking of it as medicinal. They're thinking about it as, you know, let me get what I want. You know, let me manipulate situations. But that's because that's the way that the European who was writing about this, that's the way they thought of it. That's how they perceived it. That's the way they presented it. And that's the way it's documented in history. So even when you hear any story of us or any newspaper publication or anything like that, it's always seen as this form of manipulation, right. you know, and oh, they can do something. They have a way about doing something that we don't understand, but it's powerful and it's manipulative and we want to shut it down. And so we don't recognize it, you know, to be our tradition that can bring us back into a certain form of alignment and order because you know, that's not how it's being presented to us. So, you know, um, I think that's kind of important as we as we begin to think about, you know, the traditions and where we're moving forward to, we have to look at how our perception has been shaped by their perception, you know, and how do we move out of that? How do we stop being a concept in this foreign culture and move it back into how do we see ourselves and our proper culture so that, you know, we're not just the rebellious ones in, in, you know, basically European and now American culture, but we are in alignment in our own, you know, culture, you know? Right. So I, you know, I heard you talk about, you know, different terms, different words, and I know that we've discussed um, the word that we often both use, which would be conjure. And uh, we've also talked about how, you know, these words that sound a certain way, that is not exactly the implication. Like the, the English definition of conjure is not exactly what we're talking about here. Um, we're talking more about the words that we had mm -hmm. that were, that had to do with our tradition. So for instance, in Louisiana voodoo, we have uh, Kunja, we have Kanjo. And so they have very specific meanings to the tradition that when the average person could hear, they might just say Kanja. Right. You know, can you speak to that in the hoodoo tradition and then also kind of talk about why we have a lot of these similar words and these similar concepts from tradition to tradition? Now, when you look at, um genetically as well as of course cosmologically look at different groups in west africa africa like the akan yoruba eve phone ibo bakongo fang um, gola kisi and so forth we're all closely ethnically related um genetically and then when you look linguistically you will find these different terms are very close akoko means a hen you know and in Akan or Kukos, you know, the chicken in Yoruba and so forth, you'll find various terms that are very close because we're closely related. We migrated 
we have a, a origin, a source origin from ancient Kanit, which is Nubia and Kemet. Some of us migrated west, some south, some, you know, um, central state in certain places. And, you know, we developed based on where we were at. But, um, for example, with the whole conjure piece, when we look at, and, and for example, you mentioned therapy before. Now, <laughs> they take different concepts and they take different terms and they utilize these things. And Europeans were talking about psychology and psychology and psychology, the science of the psyche and psyche is a Greek term for soul. And of course they don't know what that means, but even the term therapy, they, they won't give you an etymology for that. The term chedep and chedapi is a male and female term for a certain class of priest or priestess in ancient Kabul. The chedep and chedapi, male and female. And chedep, when you see the scepter, the chedep scepter, the chedepet scepter, it means one who guides or leads or you know teaches and so forth. That's a form of a certain class of priest or priestess. So the chedapi is the one who engages the chedep or chedapi process. And that became therapy. But that's a totally different thing <laughs> from what exactly. European are talking about. Because they're not talking about invoking forces in creation that are connected to the spirit genetic blood circle of the person and helping that person align with that specific force that governs them. A certain class of ancestresses and ancestors who move to a certain region of the earth mother. If you, if you were living in the desert region, if your clan had been living in a desert region for a thousand years, I, like in, near the Sahara Desert, like some of our people were. Then the Muslim invasions came and some of us migrated from there, moved towards the forest belt where we are now, Ghana, Ivory Coast, you know, Nigeria, that, that whole area. We had to adapt to the region of the Earth Mother, as I say, for the fertile Earth Mother, and a certain plant life, animal life, mineral life, and so forth. We incorporated that into our diets that transformed our physical bodies and so forth slightly different than they were before genetically and also the specific <laughs> manifestation of the spirits when the deities possess a specific river in this region as opposed to a river in another region the expression is slightly different when the earth mother is operant within of course the planet earth itself but the energy expressed in the desert is different than black soil so the way the divinities express themselves in certain in the forest region is slightly different than the way they express themselves, you know, in a des desert region or a mountainous region and so forth. So the manner in which we have to take in plant life, animal life, mineral life, as well as acclimate ourselves or align ourselves with the earth mother in a specific region of her body, then that changed our physical body, but it also changed our spiritual anatomy. So we were operating on a slightly different frequency than those who are still living in the desert region, some of our cousins who still live there. So we have to have different ritual practices. They're very similar, but then they change slightly. Ritual colors are different. Ritual songs are different. Certain movements are different. Ritual dances and so forth, ritual prayers, slightly different, very similar. You can see a root if you compare the two. But if you didn't know the root, you would think they were two different groups, even though they seem kind of similar. So when you have priests and priestesses, um, who can invoke the forces and creation based on the specific spirit genetic blood circle that you're connected to. And that's the tie between the ancestral spirits and the deities. The deities govern everything. Plant life, animal life, mineral life, the oceans, rivers, black substance of space, inner core of earth, the solar, lunar, planetary bodies. They are the spiritual forces that animate all features of creation. So a Yoruba person standing up under the sun and an icon person standing up under the sun, we're receiving the same sunlight. If a spirit that animates the sun possesses a Yoruba person, the same spirit possesses an icon person because we have a different constitution because we've migrated to a different part of the earth mother. And our ancestors and ancestors, their bodies were changed, but there's an ancestral difference. They pass that on to us. And the way the deities manifest in that region is slightly different, so our rituals are different. So that's, that's the difference. So it is an ancestral tradition, same deity, different tradition. <laughs> and so that's why we need to go within our actual tradition because right. that matters, the expression of how that divine force of nature comes out. That's the reason why we say it's ancestral, Right. you know? Because it, it comes through, you're not, you're not just going out and you can go out and breathe energy in from the sun, but you have, you have a body, your body, you don't have, you're not a clone of everybody else. Right. 
your body looks the way it does because you came through a specific blood circle and you all migrated to different regions of the earth mother's body. And this, of course, for black people only because we're the only ones who can align with that force of nature or any force of nature. So, but a European can't deal with that. And they're talking about being a therapist. <laughs> and of course, people know who are, who've been in the field of mental health, they know that therapist spells out T-H-E-R-A-P-I-S-T, the rapist. So that's a totally different thing. <laughs> therapist and the rapist is the same word. But for us, Chatapi, that's a totally different connotation. It has to do with aligning with the forces in nature that govern the person through a specific ancestral blood circle and how to realign. So you can be that cell in the great divine body to execute a certain function. And that has to do with how do you do that? Conjure is the means by which you affect that. So some people try to say that conjure is an um, Africanization when we use these certain terms like conjo or conche and con and so forth. That's an Africanization. We didn't know how to pronounce conjure. So, so he said, this is a conjure man and conjure woman. And they're like, well, the Negroes are trying to say con. And they're not pronouncing their R's properly. So when we did the etymological breakdown of that in the Akan language, Kanche, Kanche man, Kanche woman, but Kanche means to utter incantations to bring the spirits forth. So Ka means to speak, utter, say, or tell. That's one term. Ache means the coming forward, coming forward of the sun. Like when you see the light coming forward in the dawning. If someone says good morning in Akan, you say Ma Ache. That means I give Ma Ache dawning. That means the coming forward of the light, the coming forward of the sun. Or they say, me ma wache, I give you dawning. I give you the coming forth. So ache means the coming forth of the sun, the, the light from that was in the underworld, in the darkness, all of a sudden is showing up. So ma ache means I give you dawning or good morning. Ache means to bring forth, as in the bringing forward or the coming forth of the sun. So ka ache means to utter incantations, ka, to ache, bring the spirits forth. So the spirits are hidden, but when they manifest, you see their effects because they possess somebody, they start moving different, they speak different, they lay hands, they heal and so forth. So an unseen force from the spirit realm is manifested in the physical realm. Physical, yeah. When the sun manifests in the morning, it's an unseen force, it's dark, and all of a sudden, when it just peaks across the horizon, the rays shoot across the horizon, everybody's illuminated, but they're also empowered. They're vitalized. When a spirit shows up, you become illuminated with the wisdom of the divinities, but you also become empowered. So ka ache means to utter incantations, ka to bring the spirits forward, ache. And that's a compound word in our tradition. So, and it also means it has to do with divination. So, but then <laughs> we had to trace it back to ancient Quebec because Negroes would say the Akan people Akanized the English word Akanja, which of course they didn't. <laughs> so if you look in the ancient Kometi language, it was due to the hieroglyphs. The word ka in ancient Kemet means to speak, utter, say, or tell. And ache means the coming forward of the sun. And the specific meduk or hieroglyph of ache is the sun peaking above the horizon with the rays shooting up. It's not the sun fully above the horizon. That's a different glyph. It's the first half portion of the sun, the rays shooting up. And it's the sun emerging the first light. So ka and che. And H. Kemet is the exact same, same thing as it means in Akan, Kanche. So when we said we're a Kanche man or Kanche woman, in Akan, that's exactly what we're saying. And then when we get to North America, they say, hey, that's a Kanje man, that's a Kanje woman. They were literally saying, I'm a Kanche man, I'm a Kanche woman. And they were also identifying their ethnic group at the same time. But it's 100% cosmological, and they knew that instinct. So. You said something that's, um, you know, slightly off the subject, but you said something that made me think about how many things that we thought of as our elders mispronouncing English words that actually may have some significance. I remember um, even just being a little girl and uh, my grandparents and their, you know, contemporaries would say, I see you to Sinan. And I knew I knew that they were talking about later in the day. Mm -hmm. It took me until I was a teenager to realize they were saying this evening. 
Okay. <laughs> but why, you know, the difference and, and, and so then I would say, okay, well, you know, you, you're learning and you're like, you're, you're constantly correcting them, but you don't know the implications of what, how they took the African word and they took the English word and they found some meeting point in communication and why, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's not that hard hearing certain words over, over and over. I'm sure they could pronounce it in the, with the English, you know, um, pronunciation very easily, but why did they hold on certain words? We assume maybe at some point that that was ignorance, but that's not necessarily it. They had their reasons for maintaining language in a certain way because it was it was holding on to what we had, you know, before. Now, exactly. those sound changes, those inflections. Mm -hmm. That's everybody else has an accent, but they'll say we hold on to an accent. We're just being ignorant. ignorant. Right, right. You know, so I know that now, you know, we have this, especially since Hoodoo is being very heavily marketed to us. You know, we kind of get this idea of. You know, there's a plenty of, you know, how to practice voodoo books and right. courses and, and, and certifications, as silly as that is. Right. Um, and so everybody gets this idea that I learned this certain, you know, information, which is usually the medicinal aspect of it. Right. And then, you know, you go out and you can call yourself, I'm a, a root worker, I'm a conjure woman, I'm a, a voodoo man, any, any you know, um, variation of, of those terms, uh, two-handed, you know, woman or, or anything like that. Any of those variations and everybody feels equally entitled to say that about themselves, but understanding what they're, what, how people are handling it now, say in the past 30, 40 years, as opposed to how they handled it at the turn of the century and even before, in our history, how much of the tradition, along with the you know hierarchy, the positions, the titles, the priesthood, how much of that do you think was preserved? I would say just just looking at it, the whole tradition tradition has been preserved in different under different names. Sometimes they're utilizing the same terms, like you said about Mojo and Jack and Hank, and you know do and Kanche and so forth. Um, sometimes they're using English translations to preserve certain things, but it, it's really, it, it seems like, you know, it's been corrupt for a long time, but it really, if you go back to the, after the 40s, when you get into the 50s and 60s, that's when things really began to get corrupt. Mm -hmm. And then the 60s with, you know, the whole beatnik movement and all that kind of stuff, make love, not war, and, and people smoke weed and all that. All that kind of stuff and loosening social protocols across the country, but uh, that's targeted towards us, drug use and all that kind of stuff. But in the 20s and 30s and, and 40s and so forth, the people who were elders in the 40s, they were born in the 1800s. So just like for me, my great grandmother, she transitioned a few months before I went to high school. So I, you know, I knew my great grandmother and so forth. So, but she was born in 1899. So. If you imagine people who were living in the 40s, just like I know knew her and she can tell me different things, you know, before she transitioned. And she she was like um what uh, 82 when she transitioned. Um just like I could talk to somebody who was born in 1899. Well, she could talk to somebody who was born in 17, you know what I'm saying? In 1799. Somebody was if her grandmother you know, we've had people who were in our their late 90s who transitioned. If she had a grandmother who was 102 years old, then she was born in 1797. So she could talk to somebody just like I could talk to her. She could talk to somebody who was born in 1797, and they can tell her, you know, my grandmother used to do this, meaning her grandmother was born in 1767. Or what was born on the continent, they'll say, well, my grandmother was born in she was brought into enslavement. So they had a direct line. Just from my great grandmother, we can get the direct tradition from her saying, hey, this is what my great grandmother used to do. Just like you, you're my great grandson, my great grandmother, she used to tell me this is what we did. So we actually still had the tradition. If you look at, for example, certain things that people today wouldn't recognize as the tradition that's right in front of their face. 
people, especially scholars, know about, well, our kind people have quote unquote day names. So if you're born on Sunday and you're, you're male, you're Kwesi or Akwesi, you're a woman, you're Akosui or Esi or Tojo and Ajua on Monday or Pame and Ama on Saturday or Kofi or Afu and so forth. People know about that and they'll say, well, these are day names. You're born on a Friday, you're named after the day Friday. And then in English, they continued that. If you look in South Carolina, like the South Carolina Gazette from the 1800s and so forth, and they're talking about the people who were enslaved, they have Kwesi and Kojo and Abana and Kwabana and all these different names. And then you look later on, we would have different versions of that. So sometimes people just call themselves Friday. My daughter's name is Friday. My daughter's name is Monday. That's because, or Saturday, <laughs> you know, they were still maintaining the icon tradition. But instead of using the icon names, they were using English names, but they knew they were born on this day. And when you understand what it's really about, it's a specific deity that governs the solar lunar planetary body that governs the day. So it's a soul name as well as a name. So I'm Kwesi, I mean Kwa, I see I'm a servant of the divinity I see. That's the deity that governs my head because I was born on his day. And I was born on his day because he made sure that I came out of the womb on his day to indicate to the community this is my child. I'm not born on a day and therefore I'm named after a deity. I'm named after a deity because deity was installed in my head region before I incarnated into the womb. And that deity makes sure I come out on his day. And the same thing with a woman, make sure that she's born on the female divinity's day to indicate to everybody else, this is my child. So you come into the world with the divinity. That whole day naming system or soul name system for people born on certain days, and that means they're a child of a specific divinity. If they don't know the cosmological structure, they just know, oh, so and so is Kojo with Ruby Kujo, you know, um, or so and so is Kwame this, or, you know, Ama that, and so forth. But that's the major pantheon in the Akan tradition. The 11 Akra Dein Bosom is the major pantheon. They're found in every Afro Akani Afro tradition. We just organize them differently in the Akan tradition. But that's the major, major deity pattern. If someone's talking about hoodoo and that you, they can't tell you who are the deities in the hoodoo tradition, then they're not practicing hoodoo. They may know a certain things about medicine that they learned from their grandparents, or they may be clairvoyant, clairsentient, or something like that. But if they can't tell you who's the deity that governs my head in the Akan tradition, who's the deity that governs my magic plan and patchup plan, and who are my ancestors and ancestors, then they're not practicing the tradition. That's the basic. They're just heard about some certain things, but every tradition has, Abosom has deities, Orisha, Abosom and so forth. You will see some people saying, well, Hoodoo doesn't have deities. We just work with our ancestors. We lost the knowledge of deities. There's no pantheon in Hoodoo. It's not like Voodoo. Voodoo is just a, you know, botanical arts and so forth. And, and we lost the names of Daisy. Some people say that and we just work with, you know, nature. Everybody works with nature. <laughs> nobody is, there's nobody that doesn't work with nature. Just say you don't know who the deities are because you don't know who the ethnic group is, who is the foundation of the tradition. But when you find that out and then you look in the culture, I remember somebody who's a, you know, he's somewhat of a anthropologist to a certain extent, more like an enthusiast, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Talk about African-American culture. He was like, one thing that the, our people, you know, the Akan people contributed to North America is the day naming system. But then at the same time, he didn't know that the day naming system had to do with the deities. If he knew that, he would, do, would know that that's part of the Hoodoo tradition and that's the major pattern. Since they didn't know that portion, he could identify and acknowledge the fact that we maintain the Akan day naming system in North America for hundreds of years, but it wasn't connected. He didn't think that was connected to religion at all. But any Akan person who's practicing tradition, you know that. Now on the continent, because Christianity and Islam, many of them don't know that the deities are governing their souls. They think they're born on Friday because, or they're a fool because they were born on Friday. And some of them had to read our work to find out. And then some of their other people who still practice confirmed it for them like, well, yes, he's accurate because this is what it is. And then of course we went further and showed that every one of those 11 deities in the Akan tradition, they exist in ancient Kemet with the same names, governing the same solar lunar planetary bodies with the same ritual colors, the same function. 
just to prove it conclusively? I think that um, we, just as a people, where now that we <clears throat> we've removed some of the misconceptions about our traditions being evil or even our traditions being non-existent or forgotten. You know, now that we've removed that, those misconceptions, we're very eager to get back into our traditions. And so, you know, I hear a lot of people say, can you recommend some books to me? Can you do this? Can you do that? Um, you know, what should I start doing? And I went and I bought all of this stuff and, and, and so on. And, you know, even as people may be leaders or even presenting themselves as leaders, priests and priestesses, experts, scholars, and so on, we're so eager to tap back into the tradition that sometimes, you know, we have these half truths. So we have this information that's not really complete or not even really accurate, but it looks and feels like the, the, the right thing or the real thing. And so we just go with it. We just want to be in the essence of that. You know, I know something about the Yoruba tradition, so I'm going to just practice that and throw in, you know, a few words like mojo and things right. like that. And sprinkle. then now I, yeah, just sprinkle a little bit of hoodoo right. on, on my ifa, right. you know, and because we're, it's almost like it's, it's, there's a danger there of us totally losing what we've preserved in, in, in knowledge based on this desire or this need to kind of create and fill in the blanks with the things that we don't necessarily know, you know, person to person. What do you think the best way, how can we moving forward keep order in the traditions and basically weed out the misinformation, weed out the people who are inaccurately presenting and really present the real traditions without corruption? Well, one thing that has changed slightly and one thing that gave rise to a lot of corruption running rampant is this notion that you don't question the elders and elders. Now, you don't quote unquote challenge the spiritually cultivated elders and elderesses only because you can investigate the information that was accurate. So, um, and that, that was a traditional approach to, you know, community and so forth. But that concept of you're not challenging the elders and elderesses, that allows people who don't know what they're talking about <laughs> to say and do whatever you want. And you even 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, there were people who were normally nominally intelligent people. But once they get involved in something ancestral, they're like, oh, my elder said you can't do that. You know, my elder said that you know Jesus wasn't a racial. They start talking crazy like that. <laughs> and then people are like, well, the elder said it, and you don't go against your elders in, in the African tradition. In the African tradition, they start spitting out slogans. Mm -hmm. In the African tradition, we don't go against our elders. Mm -hmm. In the African tradition. So but now some of those things are changing. If you look deep within the culture, that slogan hasn't been totally accurate. You have, in our Khan language, for example, the term opanyi means an older person. But then you have the nana panyi, who's the spiritually cultivated older, elder, or elders person. You have the kwasea panyi. Kwasea means stupid or foolish. So kwasea panyi means stupid or foolish older person. That's part of the cosmology and culture of Akan people and everybody else. So this notion that you don't disobey your elders. In Akan tradition, you disobey the kwasea panyin because that's the stupid or foolish kwasea panyin who will lead you to your destruction. You follow the nana panyin. And plural is nana no panyin for the spiritually cultivated class of elders and elders. And those are the ones when they transition, they become the spiritually cultivated Ancestors and ancestors, the Nananom and Samafo, as opposed to just the regular ancestral spirits of transition. So, when we have people um, who understand those basic principles, then anything that anybody says, puts forward, can be and should be questioned. 
proper judgment, as we say, is the hallmark of truth. Anything that anybody says, you need to investigate it before you incorporate it. If we did that, 99% of this corruption would be eradicated because you know people would see who's misinformed. And you don't incorporate anything until you can verify. We incorporate it first, and then when somebody says, why are you doing that? Then they will tell another person, well, prove to me it's not true. How about you prove to yourself it is true before you incorporate it? Mm -hmm. We're doing it totally backwards. So the other thing is, you know, just like you see on social media, people will have to say, listen, I will never DM you to ask you if you want to read. You know? I have to go through that. <laughs> right. <laughs> priests and priests who are you know, traditional people, diviners, we will never chase anybody down for reading. We're never trying to get people to come to us. We're never trying to, we're putting things in place, as much information as possible to minimize the number of people we're trying to come because most things people should be doing on their own. Just like physically, you raised with your parents and they show you certain things. Most things that happen to you physically, you can take care of, you don't have to run to the doctor every other week, every time you have a runny nose, you're raised from the time you're a child until you leave the house. You rarely have to go to a doctor. Once a year, once every other year, if something is really crazy, you have to get surgery or something like that, but that's very, very rare. It's the same thing with the priest of priests. You don't have to run to a priest of priests to get divination every other week, but every little thing. And the way we're normally raised in the culture, you learn how to cultivate yourself spiritually from the time you're a child into puberty and to adulthood and so forth. So there's certain things that you know how to take care of and there's certain things that you have, you develop a relationship with against the mindful like you were talking about and certain things you can discern. But the more you engage your ancestral spirits, the spiritually cultivated ones, the more of a relationship you have. So when people come forward and try to force things on you, try to get you to follow them, that's a red flag. Yeah. Of course, if they're trying to, get you for money or sex and all these other things, but people who are really diviners, they're not trying to get people to follow. They're not trying to get a following. They're not trying to collect a group of God children just so they can say, look at all my God children. Yeah. Or look at all my clients. They're trying to assist work. people. Right. <laughs> they're trying to empower people. You can't, if you're really doing some work, there are too many people out here to try to serve like that. People need, they have their own spirit. Mm -hmm. They have their own crowd, their own soul, prawa. They have their own function in creation. They came into the world to execute a specific function. It is incumbent mm -hmm. upon them. And we learned that as pubescence. When you go through rites of passage, 14 and 15 years old, you solidify, crystallize what your function in the world is. You learn it before you do that. But once you move into that level of power and influence, because you have the capacity now biologically to bring an ancestral spirit back into the world now you're forced into a position where you need to take that energy seriously and begin to execute your function and work on that consistently from that point forward so you learn early on you have a function to execute you have power you have influence you have the capacity to expand that power utilize that influence to better yourself and you know further your community so somebody running around trying to keep people stagnant so they have to keep running to them for you know, direction and guidance. And they are the therapist that becomes the rapist, you know what I'm saying? But when we do things properly, you start off by, like you said before, developing a relationship with your ancestors and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. I remember telling somebody, um, the best institution I ever had was going to the Nkomre, the ancestral shrine, like six years in a row without missing a day. There was one time I missed by, by a few minutes. You know, I was trying to get home before sunrise, missed it. But other than that, engaging them on a consistent basis to see how the spirit realm works and how they operate and how they communicate, like you said before, how they, it, 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 we always use the example of a child when you first have a, you know, an infant, every time they cry, they're just crying. But the more in tune you become with them, one cry you can discern, oh, that's because they need to be changed. This particular cry, they're in pain. This particular cry, they're hungry. This particular cry, they're sleeping and so forth. You can discern the differences because you're in tune with them, but you engage them on a daily basis. Yeah. You have to engage the Samapha on a consistent basis. You know, like you said earlier, is that an ancestral spirit communicating or a non-relative communicating? Is that one of the abos on the deities communicating? How do they communicate? Do they communicate by saying, 
he cheated on you, now you cheat on him. <laughs> they actually not do it. You know what I'm saying? But you won't know that unless you engage them. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is anything that anybody says, presents, puts forward, propounds, and so forth, you have the capacity and the responsibility to verify before you even entertain the idea of incorporating it. Yeah. If we do those basic things, we can end all that stuff. And you mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of this has to do with accountability. We're not trying to uh, cultivate a group of people that are that need to depend on you for every little thing. We ultimately want people. Number one, you hold yourself accountable for the decisions that you make, the things that you do, and then you become, you know, uh, knowledgeable enough and familiar enough with your own. Uh, ancestral practices with your own ancestors that you're able to take care of a lot of this just at home with your own shrine, you know, and um, we kind of have to separate because, you know, honestly, if, if you are in the United States right now, the, the basis of what you think about ancestral tradition is basically coming from Cuba because that's, that, that became the blueprint. So even if you were coming from Haiti, if you were coming from Louisiana, by the time, you know, the 70s and beyond came here, there was a very strong influence coming from the Cuban-based traditions of how this thing should go. For those Cuban jazz music, musicians and everything. Yeah. That's super hot. So, you know, the idea of you can't do anything, you must go to a babalao for this and for that and you know, you need to go and get this done, you know, at certain times or whatever, just examine it, you know, not to say that everything that, that is presented to you is incorrect, but examine it, you know, that may have been done for a certain reason over here or over there, or there may be a certain level of corruption that has gotten into these traditions over time because of the money making part of it, you know, uh, it became a way of, of, of ensuring that, you know, there was regular money coming in. I'm not, I'm not picking on any particular uh, tradition, any particular house, any particular group of people, but just recognize that the blueprint that you might have, what you might have access to online, or you might have access to with your books and things like that may not even be what is in your tradition that is a part of your bloodline. So let your ancestors guide you in this, even when it comes to taking the word of, of another person that may even be an expert, see what your ancestors have to say about that. When you get that information, how does this sit with you? What messages do you receive? You know? I'm going to um, open it up for some questions because we're getting close to the uh, close to the end. Let's see. So um, we had, it was going to be two hours. We had, we had the Zoom for three just in case. <laughs> we had two hours and 50 minutes. So, but it, you know, it's necessary. Um, Okay, so if you have any questions in the chat room or if you want to unmute yourself, if you have a question or a comment, you can do that as well. <laughs> Earlier. And again, this is, you know, this is the first time we're doing this in the context of like, you know, a podcast and so forth. And we're going to do more podcasts. I have a the Hoodoo cast, as we mentioned, let me show, show for the people who didn't see that earlier. Um, so that's the page. We just put this, you know, put the page up. And of course, the very first Hoodoo cast is, you know, our Etchy Sign Conference. Um, we have three conferences a year the Hoodoo Mind Festival in October. Um, which is dealing with the Hoodoo tradition, um, the Etchy Sign Conference in March, which deals with the various traditions specifically that we preserve in North America in our blood circles. So 
like today, of course, we're talking about the voodoo tradition, voodoo tradition, juju, which is Yoruba, Wanga, which is Obambo, Gola, Kisi, which is Gullah, Gichi, and so forth. Our specific traditions we preserve. We have the conference, the Ojidamai conference, the nationism conference to nation building, rooted in our ancestral religious values about the summer solstice of June. But then Kalinda has the voodoo conjure fest. You can tell them about the voodoo conjure fest. Okay, so. The Voodoo Conjure Fest is centered around our Voodoo New Year. Um, and so October 31st, November 1st, that's our main time. And some people recognize this time as Halloween and All Saints, All Souls, all those things. But in our tradition, it is just our Voodoo New Year. And um, the, the festival is something that I developed. Um, I used to always do ceremony for our New Year. And it developed out of um, just, a, I guess, a bone that I had to pick about, you know, there being so many events and so many things happening in the city in the name of voodoo that had nothing to do with voodoo. You know, it was either to present some music or it was to present some inauthentic form of or, or inauthentic presentation of what voodoo was supposed to be. So the festival that I have is uh, very grassroots, but it's um, a week long, usually a week long. Sometimes it's been three days, sometimes it's been about a week. Every day and every evening we do something, whether it's a, uh, a lecture, whether it's a ceremony, whether it's an art exhibition, you know, um, dance, drum classes, something that teaches on and presents and helps the average person to have some kind of experience with the authentic tradition and culture. And so um, last year we had people who were able to attend virtually as well. You know, you can definitely come physically. We'd be glad to have you. Um, I think you'll, you would really enjoy it as well, but uh, even virtually, we had different classes, and we try to focus on things, not just the, the, the things that will just spark a person's curiosity and all this sensational ideas that they might have, but we're talking about things, and we're presenting things that can help you get back into your practice, whether you are near a group of people, or whether you're at home and it's just you, or maybe just you and your family how you can get back into your ancestral practices and how we can really understand our traditions and culture and bring it back into practice in a way that's beneficial for us. So, you know, um, this year, I believe it's from the 27th to the 1st. I have to look at the dates again, but I'll get that information out. Okay, so we, um, I just posted this Appreciate that. Just posted this. This is our poster, the film poster. And you will see that, of course, myself, Voodoo Queen Kalinda, Bravo, and Sashat to Ankwa Jet, and Kajara Niya, I never had a moment, Mabusi Ashakir. We produced a film a few years ago, and it is online for on demand. You can check that out. Amaru Kafo Adibisa. And it's dealing with the forms of divination that we preserved in our different traditions and our blood circles here in North America. So Mama Mawusi deals with the Juju tradition, which is Yoruba, ancestral religion in North America. Kajara deals with the Fang tradition, the Ngangain tradition, which is Fang, F-A-N-G from Gabon to Cameroon, but she has like ancestry, brought certain healing practices, including the laying of hands and using the key energy and so forth which is a Fang term, key, which means life force energy and so forth. She deals with the form of divination that preserved in her blood circle. Sishatut Angwajet, Ovambo, the Wanga tradition, which is the Ovambo tradition. Um, she deals with the form of divination that's preserved that way, which is part of the Gullah constellation. Belinda deals with voodoo and, you know, forms of divination in that fashion. And then I deal with the Hudu tradition, of course, which is the Akan tradition. Of course, Voodoo is Ebe, Voodoo is Akan tradition, and the major form of divination that I utilize as an Okamafo in the Voodoo tradition and how that 
system was preserved in the blood circle. So you can uh, access that film on demand on our website. And we, we post that up regularly on, you know, a different social media platforms and so forth. So, all right, so it's only three minutes left. So we can go ahead and end it here. I want to say, yeah, I'll say, you know, saving the show. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, we appreciate everybody for joining in. If you have any questions, of course, you can reach out to us um, on social media. What is your social media? Everything is Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau. And please, excuse me, please um, be sure that, you know, the person is not messaging you because I do have a lot of uh, impersonation pages that pop up, but I'm Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, YouTube. And I think I'm Voodoo Queen Laveau on TikTok, but I don't have much on TikTok yet. Right, yeah, she does have, it's a lot of people They'll spell Voodoo Queen, Linda Bo with a uh, period at the end or a little space. A lot of fake pages, so you have to make sure. And then sometimes you can see the people who are following them, you know, to see who's really, really who. Um, of course, my handle is Ojirafo on Instagram, Ojirafo as well as Kwesi Akan on Facebook, Ojirafo on uh, Twitter, um, TikTok, and uh, YouTube. So once again, we want to say Yerase. We thank everybody for tuning in to this eighth annual Echisan Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference. And Yebeshia Bio, we will meet again. That's it.